New York City, I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad. Make smarter decisions for their portfolio. Tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. That's right. We've got a huge show for you today. We're live from the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. We've got our very own Brian Sazi and Julie Hyman on the ground covered in snow. As you can see, we'll have interviews with Verizon Chairman and CEO Hans Vestberg, Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan, and Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates, just to name a few. Brian and Julie are taking over the morning brief with the latest headlines out of Davos. But first, let's get the layout for road, your roadmap for the day and get right to it with the three things that you need to know. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer, Josh Lipton, and Rochelle Kufo have more. Yeah, Shauna, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, the latest Wall Street banks to report this morning. Goldman posting a 51% rise in profit in its fourth quarter, boosted by a surge in equities trading and higher asset and wealth management revenues. This capping off a challenging year on Wall Street as a slowdown in deal making weighed on Goldman's net income for the year. Meanwhile, Morgan Stanley out with its first report under new CEO Ted Pick, seeing a drop in profit thanks to a combined $535 million in one-time charges. And shares of Tesla moving to the downside in extended trading as Elon Musk declares he wants more control of the EV company. Posting on X, he is, quote, uncomfortable growing Tesla to be a leader in AI and robots without having around 25 percent of voting control. What the announcement means for shareholders later in the show. That's right, Josh. And it looks like it's shaping up to be a rematch of President Biden versus former President Donald Trump in November. Trump triumphs over his Republican rivals at the Iowa caucus on Monday. Now with a smaller field as entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy ends his presidential campaign after coming in fourth and throwing his support behind Trump. The next contest in the GOP presidential race is the New Hampshire primary on January 23rd. We'll break down what these elections could mean for your portfolio. We have a jam-packed day for you here at Yahoo Finance. Let's head over to Brian Sazi and Julie Hyman. They are on the ground at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, speaking with top business leaders and policymakers. Sazi and Julie, you guys have certainly been busy and have a busy couple of hours here for us today. Yes, we have been busy, and we're going to be sharing so many of these interviews with you that we are excited about, including Eurasia's Ian Bremmer. Uh, we talked to Bill Gates, which was really has been a highlight for us as well. Yeah. Hey, Sean, what do you think? Is a free trip? We're working our tail off here in Davos, <laughs> Switzerland. I mean, that snow might look nice, but come on, we're working our butt off here. But anyway, to that end, uh, Julie also talked to Bank of America CEO Brian Monahan. Really fascinating chat on interest rates and the future of the economy. And you talked to PepsiCo CEO Ramon Lugarda. And I should uh, name drop here. Not only did we talk to Ramon, it was an exciting exclusive Yahoo Finance oh, interview on the me. future of big food. But you have your big three things to watch, and we have sort of three themes that we are watching here in Davos. And the first one has to actually do with what's going on in the United States and the Iowa caucuses. Of course, former President Trump winning there as yeah. expected in Iowa. But when we talked to Ian Bremmer, he really said that is one of the main topics of conversation here in Davos, the prospects of another Trump presidency. Listen to what he had to say. Everyone's talking about it. I mean, there's a lot of ice out there right under the ice, just under the ice, is sheer panic um, on the part of certainly every European leader. You may have seen Christine Lagarde, the head of the ECB, uh, who came out publicly saying that she thought that Trump was a, a, a serious uh, risk for Europe, for trade relations, for uh, America's role in the world. She's the only one that said that publicly. Every European leader I'm speaking to privately is concerned. I just had a meeting with a very senior Japanese delegation this morning. That was issue number one, two, and three. And they say, back in Tokyo right now, every CEO, that is what they're worried about. It's not yet dominating the media, but compared to the last two months ago when I was in Tokyo, it's become much more real. I think people were hoping that, you know, it can't really be real. I mean, given 91 indictments and given, you know, all of the legal exposure and the fact that in Washington, D.C., Trump could very easily be convicted before an election, something's going to happen to stop him. No, it's not. No, it's not. The only thing standing in the way of Trump winning is 81-year-old Joe Biden, um, who has a record to run on, uh, but also has a lot of people that feel like he's not actually up to the job. And that is a serious concern for a former president who refused to accept the free and fair transfer 
of power. I mean, that's existential. It's foundational to any democracy. In any well-functioning democracy, if you had this going on, this would be the number one, two, and three issue. And yet, in our country, it's not. What's the conclusion you take from that? It's that our democracy is not well-functioning. It is a democracy in crisis. And yes, that is the top issue being discussed at Davos. Democracy in crisis, really, Julie, uh, was one of the main takeaways from our chat with Ian Bremmer. Uh, and it really is, this is one of the main things, things being talked about here on the, uh, on the ground uh, at Davos, at uh, the World Economic Forum. What would another Trump presidency mean? Right. And what I'm trying to figure out, Julie, what, is, what would that mean to the markets? What would it mean to the economy? But also, what would it mean in the lead up to the election? I mean, this is a market that is really still trading at record highs. But if this is now a key risk, this debate, this race, what does it mean for investors? What should they be doing today? Yeah, it looks like Swiss emergency vehicles are, are, are <laughs> it's not even election day alarmed yet. about it, too. I mean, it was also interesting because Bremer did say in the short term, he does not think that this will necessarily yep. be a threat to the U.S. economy or to the markets, especially given what we saw last time there was a Trump presidency. But he said in the longer term, there could be questions about the U.S. credit rating, for example. Some of the other leaders we talked to were a little more diplomatic when it came to a Trump presidency and basically emphasized that they would manage through it no matter who wins the election, and maybe we're not quite as alarmed as Bremer was. So that was an interesting perspective to hold as well. But I think it's interesting the emphasis that Bremer had on Europeans in particular, because his view is that a President Trump will not be supportive of Ukraine in its fight against Russia. And that is something that is of keen interest and is causing concern among the Europeans. Also of keen interest, of course, is direction of interest rates. Mm. This is a market that has been, up, been bid up really to record highs on expectations of it up to at least six, uh, six interest rate cuts this year. And we talked to Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan about the direction of interest rates. Take a listen. Our team has four cuts next year and four cuts in 25. And so that gets you down in the three, three and a quarter, three and a percent, three and a half percent uh, range. Um, so that will feel quick. But it's, go, it, it's less the pace, it's where it stops out. And what, I, what would be good for the U.S. is they could actually get to a normal rate curve, which for 15 years we haven't had. Like for a moment we had it in, in 1819, and then they started cutting rates. People forget in 19 they had to cut rates to push the economy. So we have that eight cuts over two years. Inflation gets down to the target for the Fed at the end of 25. So it takes some time. And people say it's higher, but in the grand scheme of history, that's not higher. It's just higher since you know, the financial crisis on a global basis, rates fell, and now they're coming back up to be a little more. Of course, there's always debate about interest rates, about the economy. We talked to Ann Walsh, uh, the CIO of Guggen Guggenheim Partners Investment Management as well. She sees six cuts. That was a big number when year. she dropped that. I'm like, Yeah, but that's, wow. that's what the market had been, you know, the market has been pricing in more cuts as well. So. You know, there, it's in, of, obviously that's of central interest as well, even here because uh, the U.S. economy is so pivotal. It was it was really fascinating to hear Brian talk about six cuts and, uh, or four cuts and Ann Walsh at six cuts. And I think we can take away here. Nobody knows really where rates are going. It depends on the inflation now look. And, of course, that job uh, is the tough job, I should say, of Jerome Powell, Fed chief. Yeah. And then, of course, one of the other big conversations that we had, the, one could argue, <laughs> the biggest, was with Bill Gates of the yes. Gates Foundation. And he's here talking talking about global, uh, global health, but of course, he is also talking about one of the main other topics that everybody's talking about here in Davos, and that's AI. It's on every sign, it's on everyone's lips here, it's almost part of every panel practically here. So we asked him about it and sort of the risks and rewards of this new generative AI technology. Well, certainly AI can be used for all, you know, it can be used for cyber attacks, it can be used to design a bioterrorism weapon, you know, whenever we have new technologies, they're used to achieve positive goals uh, and, and for some challenging things as well. So far, every technology we've come up with, even though we have some like nuclear uh, weapons that are still to this day very, very scary, we've managed to keep them under control. And so the idea that there's a lot of talk getting government people to understand AI, you know, could it be something where it's almost too addictive to sit there and, and talk to it? You know, what should the guidelines be? You know, when we had computers, books, video games, you know, we had to think, okay, what's the tasteful, appropriate use uh, to just get the good and minimize those, those negative things? Well, I think about... 
And, and Julie, of course, uh, I think a lot of people that like, trade stocks and, and are on the Yahoo Finance platform, platform think of AI as chip stocks, what Alphabet might be working on, on various chatbots. But Bill Gates here uh, at Davos is really looking at it through the lens of healthcare. And I had the chance mm -hmm. to listen to a panel or discussion of him this morning looking at changes to healthcare driven by AI. A mode owner CEO spotted him uh, in the audience. That was pretty neat to see. But again, that's what his message here, and that's what he's focused on. What good could AI do for global civilization? Yeah, that seems to be a big part of the conversation. Well, speaking of all the conversations we're having here, we've got a great one coming your way next. We'll be speaking with Verizon Chairman and CEO Hans Vesper. I have a feeling we're going to talk AI amongst other topics. Keep it right here. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance and our coverage from the World Economic Forum in Davos. I'm Julie Hyman. This is Brian Sazi. And a lot of the conversations we've been having both on and off camera have been centered around AI, governance of AI, all the cool stuff AI can do. I even talked to a couple of folks off camera who said that they have a new AI-powered device, a generative AI-powered device called the Rabbit, which brings up the new sort of iPhone of AI race, if you will. Um, well, let's talk to somebody about all of this. Uh, Chairman and CEO of Verizon, Hans Vestberg, is joining us now. Thank you so much for being here, Hans. Thank you for having to me. You. Good to be here. So Great to be here. When I think about sort of AI-powered devices, obviously they need to run on something. Absolutely. So that help, makes me think of Verizon. Um, so how are you thinking about what comes next and how Verizon plays in it? So when it comes to AI, I mean, uh, especially the generative AI and things like that, I, I think at the edge of the network it's going to be very important to have AI to take quick decisions very close to the to the end user, the customer or the enterprise. Uh, and of course, that's how we built our network. We built our network with an enormously strong resilience from the data center to the edge of the network. Uh, so I think that 
as you're going to see over time, uh, the network will be very important. I mean, all the power you need for it, of course, to, to do all the generation of it, but also to transport all the data. And that's how we built the network. So very clearly, uh, we think that generative AI will be important for our, for our business. Uh, then, of course, we use AI already today in our in our company uh, and think that's going to be continue to be an important tool for us. As this AI permeates the United States, does that change how much you invest each year in terms of CapEx? No, not, not directly, but of course, over time, uh, the smarter you become to know where you're going to deploy your capital. Now we talk about network capital, how you build your network. I mean, in 2023, we have the guidance between 18 billion and a quarter to 19 billion and a quarter. So we invest quite heavily in capital intensive business. So if we would know you a little bit better where we have the uh, the, the holes we need to put in the cap, uh, ca uh, capacity into quicker, that will be helpful from, from AI. Ultimately, I have a person doing it, but learning where do I have the challenges, where do I have the problems, that's very important. So definitely it can make us much more efficient. Um, when you look at your business, I, I assume you guys are sort of device agnostic for end users on wireless devices, but I know you guys are trying to minimize churn at this point. You're trying to keep your wireless subscribers. Talk to us. I know you can't give us a lot of near-term discussion, but give us some big-picture commentary No, because I'm going to report my fourth quarter know, next week, so I, I will try to refrain from that. Yeah. No, I think you come to a market, if we talk wireless consumer, uh, Almost everyone in this country has a mobile phone, so it's much about retention of the customers, continue to give them great services, and building new services. I mean, we have not only the greatest network, we also built a lot of new services, especially with the content providers we have. Uh, right now in the market, we have a combination of uh, Netflix and Max. Nobody else can do that. And ultimately to give the right services and the right type of products and we also launched my plan in May where it's a basically you customize your own plan mm. this is the type of network I want this is the type of perks we call it perks what type of, I want Disney plus I want that and you can put it together and that becomes a more attractive offering so that's how you need to think about it then of course is all the new customers that you want to attract but as a smaller piece today it's much more important to see that you have the right offering for the existing customers the more tech CEOs um that I talk to, I get the sense that I'm going to need a new phone very quickly. Do you see a major iPhone, Samsung upgrade cycle in the next couple of years because of this AI? We, we have seen, of course, uh, uh, a little bit of a slowdown on on, uh, on customers getting new phones. So they, they keep the phones longer because they're getting better and better, of course. That's part of it. And the networks, of course, even better. So, uh, But, of course, every new innovation attracts new uh, uh, players in the market and, and new devices. And I think the last time they were really hyped was, of course, when the first 5G phone came. Uh, in 2019, 20, and 21. Uh, let's see if AI have the same attraction. You're going to need to see, first of all, that it gives some new application services for the consumer, especially if they're going to attract them. So we are eager to see. I probably know more than I can say, but it's going to be exciting to see what type of phones will come out in the next couple of years. Well, yeah, kind of on a related note, I mean, we heard of uh, one of your European competitors, Vodafone, coming out uh, with a new partnership with Microsoft today mm -hmm. that has to do with AI. Can we expect some things like that? from Verizon? I think we're already working with these type of things and I think that both because what you need to think about when you deliver a service to a customers you need a network to be configured right you need the devices and the modems that is making the connections right and you need the applications we are long term we work with our with our partners all the time to see that we have the best performance and the best innovative service on top of it so you can uh, you can not only expect we're already working with all these mm -hmm. players in order to see that customer get the best of, of us and there's many different parties you need to work because we are agnostic for the different type of operating system and devices. We've talked to a lot of leaders so far in the two days we've been here and especially after the Iowa caucus results, there's, this, there's now this new level of caution after these results. Of course, President Trump winning that Iowa caucus. Are you preparing for consumer weakening in the back half of the year as we get up to the election? I mean, 
the last couple uh, of years basically were preparing for a, mm-hmm. for a weakness. I think companies like ours are always prepared for different scenarios in the market. That's our job. Uh, uh, we haven't seen so much until the third quarter at least. I cannot say anything more. Um, the consumer uh, spend has been good. More important, I think that our service, mobility and broadband, is so important in today's society in order for you to be part of our society. If it's during education, work from home, or uh, maybe even healthcare or other societal things that are important. So our industry has been growing in importance for the consumer and for enterprises. And I think that's part of it as well. But let us see. We are preparing for any outcome. But uh, until the third quarter, which I reported last time, we, we didn't see much of it, nor in the, in customers' pay, payment readiness and things like that. So, uh, But let's see next week, because next week I'm going to have an earnings call. <laughs> We will we'll be, be on. listening oh, to that okay, earnings good. call, Hans. So I'm, that's I'm good, happy you're going to be on that's, it. Thank that's you. what we call a tease yeah, okay. in our business. Okay. Thank you so much, Hans Vesberg of Verizon, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much. We're going to have much, much more coming from the World Economic Forum in Davos, so don't go anywhere. I'm Julie Hyman. And I'm Brian Sazi. And we're here at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, a huge gathering with 60 heads of state and government, 800 CEOs, 1,600 business leaders of all kinds. The theme this year, rebuilding trust. And I'm glad you mentioned CEOs, Julie. Some of the biggest names in global business are, in fact, here at Davos. We have Bill Gates, HP CEO, Enrique Lores, Cisco CEO, Chuck Robbins, really everyone here to talk about rebuilding trust, Julie, but also building that trust into AI and then making a lot of money off AI. Yes, most definitely. There's a lot of sort of behind the scenes discussions that go on here between business leaders and political leaders, but also really one of the main themes of Davos every year is how to make the world a better place through these kinds of partnerships, right? Uh, How to be good stakeholder capitalists, right? That is using the business world, the corporate world to work on big thorny issues like climate change and poverty around the globe. Julie, uh, good, clean air, good, clean water. And uh, me partnering with you again for another Davos. New code for you, new code for me. I'm psyched. Nothing but up from here.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance's live coverage of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. I'm Julie Hyman. That's Brian Sazi hey. right there next to me. We've been talking to so many interesting folks here. Among them, Bill Gates, of course, president of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Among other things, he's talking about global health and how AI has been supercharging some of his work. Listen in. You know, there's a lot of things in terms of making it cheaper, faster, more accurate. Um, you know, most of the applications are just helping you be more productive. You know, when I sit down to write something, often, you know, getting hints from the AI, uh, you know, having it look things over, simplify things, it, you know, I've I found it's a real productivity increase. Likewise, for coders, you know, you're seeing 40, 50 percent uh, uh, productivity improvement, which, you know, means you can get programs sooner, you can make them higher quality, make them better. Um, so mostly what we'll see is that the productivity of white collar will go up. Um, do you think that there does need to be governance around the globe, around AI? Well, certainly AI can be used for all, you know, it can be used for cyber attacks. It can be used to design a bioterrorism weapon. You know, whenever we have new technologies, they're used to achieve positive goals uh, and, and for some challenging things as well. So far, every technology we've come up with, even though we have some like nuclear uh, weapons that are still to this day very, very scary, we've managed to keep them under control. And so the idea that there's a lot of talk getting government people to understand AI, you know, could it be something where it's almost too addictive to sit there and, and talk to it? You know, what should the guidelines be? You know, when we had computers, books, video games, you know, we had to think, okay, what's the tasteful, appropriate use uh, to just get the good and minimize those those negative things? Well, I think about social media, if there is a parallel in recent years, and it feels like there was a, a retroactive attempt to, uh, to regulate social media that wasn't quite success successful, and there was perhaps some harms from social media. Do you think that, that there's applicable lessons to AI from that? Well, what we're seeing in social media is that people will often cluster around extreme views or even uh, misinformation. And, you know, I think that's part of human behavior that you want to try and avoid. Nobody's ever, you know, come up with a set of regulations uh, that fully deal with that. You know, I'm, different countries are going to try different things. I hope we get better in that area. The AI um, comes a little bit on top of that, makes it easier to generate information. Uh, you know, it, you'll have things that look like videos and images. Um, and so it, it underscores the need to say, okay, what's the good part of social media and what's the part either for young people or misinformation uh, that regulations could reduce. How influential do you think AI uh, in its current form will be on this coming election in the U.S.? I'm not sure, you know, for this year it's going to be that uh, big of a thing. I mean, you want things that are generated by computers to be labeled that way, and people are talking about news organizations, okay, let's make sure before somebody watches, they know that this is uh, uh, an illusion, just like, you know, when you have text, you say, okay, where did you get that information from? But no, I, don't, I don't think it'll be a, a huge impact. Uh, I have to say, Sean and Brad, real uh, fun always talking to you throughout uh, the day, but it was also pretty cool to talk to Bill Gates and all things AI and healthcare. It's not uh, often you get to chat with uh, Bill Gates. Certainly not. And we won't uh, take that to heart or really take offense to that because we really agree with you there. <laughs> no, awesome. Of course, it. Julie. Great conversation. Very insightful. We look forward to uh, getting back to you guys in just a few minutes. But let's turn our attention here to the opening bell. We have at less than a minute to go until the opening bell. Investors digesting the latest round of earnings that we got here ahead of the 
the open from uh, Goldman Sachs, from Morgan Stanley. A bit of a different reaction here to those stocks. You had Goldman fluctuating in the pre-market, Morgan Stanley under a bit of pressure following their results. And we also got to look at the regionals here, here, Bad, with PNC, with their quarterly report. Lots of focus there just in terms of the health of the regionals following everything that's happened over the last nine months. So a bit of pressure here across the board. You have all three of the major averages. At least looks like we will see a downward movement here at the open. Yeah, you know, when we take a look at some of the moves that we're seeing out the gate here and you were mentioning the earnings here I mean that is really leading some of the trending stocks right now especially on the Yahoo Finance platform you're seeing Goldman Sachs lead that pack top trending ticker on the platform well, happening now we've got the opening bell on Wall Street they're taking a look at Walmart ticker symbol WMT ringing the open bell at the New York Stock Exchange and in Midtown Manhattan at the Nasdaq you've got some virtual fun funfetti happening at least on the day to kick off the day a little bit better than these snow flurries that we're getting outside but hey we needed some snow why not? Anyway, we've got Maddie Mills standing by at the New York Stock Exchange. Maddie, you're watching Tech. How is Apple and Tesla moving this morning? Those snow flurries that you mentioned, Brad, making it uh, the quietest morning that I've seen so far here at the New York Stock Exchange. And I think that's impacting some of the movement that we're seeing across the indices here. Uh, going a little bit more macro, the dollar hitting its highest highs in a month today. The 10-year yield hitting over 4%. That indicates to me that there's a little bit of a question mark regarding what's next from the Federal Reserve. Also, again, a little bit of a sleepy movement when it comes to today's trade. But let's look at some of the more specific uh, sectors names because that could be an indicator of what we're going to see throughout today's trade starting with Tesla uh, Elon Musk tweeting that he wants to have 25 percent voting control over the company if it's going to move towards AI uh, product development and he hinted at this particularly in his interview with uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin at DealBook saying that AI needs a strong leader and a lot of oversight and he was talking specifically about open AI at that time but I think that gave us an indication of his kind of ideology when it comes to AI product development. Uh, Tesla down a little over 2.3% in the free market off of that news, indicating that the street would not be pleased with Elon Musk taking more control over the company. Remember, he sold off a lot of shares after he had to... Uh, get a lot of cap capital under his belt to close that Twitter acquisition. Uh, and that's why he's now at about 13% when it comes to his shares and the voting rights associated with that. I also want to take a look at Microsoft. This name actually in the green this morning after launching Copilot as a consumer first product. This is their AI product. It's 20 bucks a month. And guys, don't forget, you can see the founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates, speaking with our very own Yahoo Finance folks on our platform. All right, Maddie, thank you so much there over at the New York Stock Exchange, really teeing up today's trading activity. I'm going to take a deeper dive into a few of those names here, especially as we were mentioning Goldman Sachs being one of the top trending tickers here this morning. Uh, I'm taking a look particularly at banks as of right now just to see some of that price action. And you're taking a look at a lot of red as of this point of time. JP Morgan, that's down by about 1.7% out of the gate. Also here, as you're taking a look at the intraday activity, as I was mentioning, Goldman Sachs, you're seeing that as one of the only bright spots. It's up by about 7 tenths of a percent right now, but HSBC down 3%. You're seeing Morgan Stanley down nearly 3%, 2.8, 2.9 to be exact there. Let's also take a look at the Dow components here on the day, just give you a look at those 30. And taking a look at Microsoft, as we were just talking about them on the day with that co-pilot announcement, you're seeing them up by about 1%. Apple, as we were mentioning, you've got some more price moves that they're going to be making in China. That's down by about 1.9%. So investors paying close attention to that. Since we mentioned Apple, let's give you a closer look at some of the NASDAQ 100 names. Tech-heavy average here as we kick off the day. It looks like there's more red than green. However, at least in some of the mega cap tech stocks, you're seeing a lot more green. So we'll see exactly where that continues to move as we go on throughout the rest of today's trading session, a holiday abbreviated trading week. We've got much more from Brian Moynihan, Bank of America CEO, on the other side of this short break.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance's live coverage here in Davos, Switzerland at the World Economic Forum. And Julie, we really had a great conversation with Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan on the direction for interest rates, geopolitical risk, but most importantly, will there, will they or will there not be a soft landing on the U.S. economy? Take a listen here as we told us. It's great to be here and, and you know, what a soft landing is, you don't go negative in GDP growth on a quarterly basis. And so our team, if we were talking last year, and we did talk last year, they basically said we were going to have a recession later in 23, early 24. And as the year went on, they pushed that out. And so now their basic view is we dropped from the growth rate in the third quarter for plus down to 1% annualized GDP growth for the first three quarters. That is a soft landing. It didn't go negative, but it it landed and got near zero. And, and so that... That's, that's the prediction. The team does a great job, and that's where they come out. And that's largely due to the consumer and the consumer strength and the resiliency and the spending and the capitalism and the you know, entrepreneurism and, and innovation in the U.S. That's what's the U.S. is different. Are rates going to fall as fast as they rose? Our team has four cuts next year and four cuts in 25. And so that gets you down in the three, three and a quarter, three and a percent, three and a half percent uh, range. Um, so that will feel quick, but it's, go, it, it's less the pace, it's where it stops out. And what, I, what would be good for the U.S. is they could actually get to a normal rate curve, which for 15 years we haven't had. Like for a moment we had it in, in 1819, and then they started cutting rates. People forget it in 19, they had to cut rates to push the economy. So we have that eight cuts over two years. Inflation gets down to the target for the Fed at the end of 25, so it takes some time. And people say it's higher, but in the grand scheme of history, that's not higher. It's just higher since you know, the financial crisis. On a global basis, rates fell, and now they're coming back up to be a little more. So there's what the sort of official forecasts from your researchers say, and then there's what people say, right? Yeah. And you talk to an enormous number of people. Yeah. Um, you're talking to a lot of people here in Davos. You talk to a lot of business leaders in the U.S. What's the vibe like, right? You know, maybe there's going to be a soft landing, but how are people feeling? Well, if you think about over the course of last year, you know, this Davos, last Davos, this Davos, every last year was recessions coming and, you know, inflation's high and the Fed, the Fed and central banks around the world took off. If you think about all that, that creates a pretty pessimistic air for people yes. to operate in. So what happened during the course of years, confidence came down by consumers. They slowed down their spending from a 10% year over year growth rate to 4 to 5%, which is more normal. Um, and so that all affects people. Um, small, medium-sized business in the U.S., we have 12 million small business customers. We have tens of thousands of middle-market customers. You know, their line usage flattened back out. So pre-pandemic, they'd use 40% of their line of credit availability on a given day. Uh, during the pandemic, it dropped to 30 because things slowed down. Rose back up to 36. Then it's been bouncing around 35, 36. It didn't keep going back up to the level it was. That's a conservatism built-in. And so that's what's kind of going through. That's what you read about. And then inflation attacks uh, the people's uh, ability to have, you know, provide for their families and stuff. And so that's a pessimist. The reality, though, is look at what they do. They're still spending at 4 four to 5% more in the first part of 24 versus the first part of 23. They are still going out to uh, the restaurant spending is still very strong. Uh, uh, entertainment spending is still very strong. So if you're really, really, really worried about you know, your day-to-day -day thing, you wouldn't do that. So what's happening is people are getting more conservative. They're making the choices uh, in the median income and, uh, households. They're making choices about what to buy, what not to buy. Uh, but the rate structure slow down, car purchase, house purchases, but fixed rate mortgages give people uh, an anchor against one word. So, but their spending hasn't changed as much as their emotions have. Right. And now you're seeing they're, they're coming a little bit more in line as you see confidence build up a little bit. Views of inflation stayed in check. And that, that's kind of interesting right now. Mm -hmm. Brian, every time we talk to you uh, in 2023, the consumer always seemed to be surprising to the upside, to yep. your point. Spending more on services, spending more, maybe a little more than some people throw on hard goods. But as we near the election in this country, yep. there's been a real... I think a lot of concern amongst the leaders we've been talking to about how that election might turn out. Do consumers, do consumers finally pull back uh, because they fear an outcome? You know, I, I, don't, I don't think so because the election goes on cons you know, consistently. The, the dialogue's out there that all, that all you and your colleagues put out there. So it's not like, it's, it's not like people didn't know 24 uh, election was coming. And by the way, there was a congressional election in a half year. So there's always something going on. And then at state and local levels. So, 
you have the real sort of, you have the geopolitical risk out there. You have the, the fact that governments have to slow down their rate of spending growth. Um, they, a lot of fiscal stimulus, they have to bring that back in. The United States has to get its budget more in line. Who, whoever's in office understands that. That's not a mystery. That's why you have the debates in Congress among the whole Congress. How do we start to balance the decision? So that, that's got to go. And by the way, that's universal around the world. And so the idea of getting government spending and local governments and state governments in the U.S., same things, getting that. So those are drags and possibilities. But meanwhile, just follow what the consumer does versus what they say, which is the first two weeks in January, they spent four to five, four and a half percent more than they spent last year, two weeks in January. And then, you know, and so they, they're, they're continuing to participate in the economy. Why? Because they're employed. Why? Because wage growth has been strong, um, flattening out, but stronger. And so if you're employed and you have money, you're going to make the choices. And so I think the election will affect that, but they sorted through it through you know, a lot of elections in our company's history, our country's history, and uh, you know, all the other countries. So I don't worry about the elections doing it. There'll be a lot of talk about the impact, but I think the reality is you know, the, it's, the, it, the U.S. economy is driven by the private sector and consumers and things that really are affected by elections but not deterred by elections. I, I mean, all of that said, it seems a rather unusual election in some ways, right? You've got one of the candidates who is under indictment on multiple fronts. You've got the other who there's concerns about his age. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. Does it affect business decisions? I mean, on the part of Bank of America, for example. I mean, how do you even begin to, to game some of that out? Well, one of your colleagues asked me, do you have a drawer for candidate X and candidate Y? I said, that'd be a lot of drawers, because think <laughs> about the changes in the UK, prime ministers, the changes in the French prime ministers. We, we're affected by that. So, so when you run a company, as my colleagues do at Bank of America, the teammates that run it, and then the companies around the world, you have to be ready for any scenario. And so our job is not to predict elections. Our job is to be able to go no matter what the circumstances are. In our country's elections, U.S. elections are not. And I tell people, our our company started in 1784, the oldest part. There's been a lot of elections. There's been a lot of, and so you have to have a, a way to operate the company for profits and purpose. You have to have a way to operate the company for the benefit of our customers, our teammates, and our shareholders and, and society. I mean, those are principles. And so the elections will come and go. We try to help every administration on both parties with our best thinking. And some take it, some don't take it, some take it a little bit. And it, our job as the business community and as Bank of America is to help comp, uh, uh, governments be successful. Because if they're successful, we're going to be successful. Uh, another big bet you're, you're making is on, on AI. You yeah. seem to be spending a, a large sum of money this year in, in modernizing yeah. the bank. How will AI change banking? Well, we have a, this uh, capability called Erica. And so Erica was started about seven years ago, and it, it is effectively AI. It's a natural language processing engine. It, it's very straightforward compared to the the autonomous language, but it was the same thing. We had to go to somebody and get produce the language. You had to produce an analytical environment around it, use our data. And it has 18 million consumers using 170 million interfaces last quarter. So it's not like, may this happen, it's happening. Each one of those within a phone call, uh, email, a text, or some or walk into the branch, and so it saves uh, money. So that's just an example of how we're using it. So we completely believe that this will have a big impact. The, the question is you gotta have your data right and we have spent billions of dollars to get our data in, uh, uh, consistency throughout our organization, and we're not perfect. Then you have to have the ability to convert processes to the technique through algorithm models and, and, and uh, language models and learning models. The tr trick in that is we have to have accountability. We have to have, uh, 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 we have to be able to say, if we made a decision to turn down a loan, how to do it, why did we do it, what were the factors, because that's the law. Otherwise, it could be discriminatory. And so in regulated industries, it's going to be a trickier application. Now, to help somebody do the work, with which then they take it and do something, fine. It's much easier. Programming, we're already using in programming. It's saving uh, money. Again, you got to have a psychological change. Your programmers have to learn how to use it and what they're going to do next versus what they did before. Great, great possibilities for us. I still think in early stages in terms of adoption, our company is a lot of hype about a lot of discussion. It's, you know, you, you could go to 14 sessions here at Davos that today on AI, I guarantee you, on some topic. Uh, but those of us that actually deploy, we put $3.8 billion of technology out. We have hundreds and hundreds of algorithm models have been operating a company for years, years and years. And so this is like a, a natural movement along a path. And we're already doing it, and we think it has great hope, but you gotta make sure you're moving right with the customer, right with the, uh, the uh, integrity of the operating systems, and right with the regulatory framework. And um, finally, I, I want to ask you about DEI a little bit, because as you know, there's been a backlash yeah. against diversity and inclusion programs. You're the um, council chair for yeah. global D diversity and inclusion at 
yeah. Bank of America. So obviously you yeah. think it's important. So what do you make of the backlash and, and how do you do it in the right way? Well, it, these things ebb and flow and they get talked about in ways that are not really about some of the topics that are involved and so you get a lot about uh, social policies and stuff like that. Look, we listen to our team. We have 200,000 plus teammates. We have 180,000 in affinity groups. We have a strong DNI council that represents the company. We have sub councils underneath it. And so, and they just give us insight as to what they need. And so we are continuously trying to improve our company, provide opportunity that anybody can come to our company, be who they are, and be as successful as they want to be. So last night I was talking to uh, a group of around the military and uh, with honor, and a group that Ry Barcott runs. And so we hired 17,000 veterans over the last few years. Yesterday, our teammate Eric Shimp celebrated his 10th anniversary of the company. Ten years ago, he started with a company out of the military, West Point military, came back, starts on a, leaves military on a Friday, starts on a Monday. He's a receptionist for a day. Ten years later, he's running Merrill Lynch. And that's because he had talent, and he did, but he had never worked in the private sector. So whether it's you know, teammates coming to the military, whether it's teammates coming from uh, Title I high schools into our operating platforms, call centers, that's why we started $23 an hour so they can invest in a career. What's the teammates have worked with us for 50, 60 years? We're providing opportunity. And so DNI is core, to, is core to how we do that. So we we will do what we do, and we're mindful of the atmosphere around us a lot, but we do, we are committed to having a place where everybody can be successful, male, female, all different ethnicities. And, and then we have to help our teammates through tough times. And that's like with the Hamas attack on Israel, we had a lot of Jewish teammates that we had to go in and support. Um, we had teammates you know, affected by the Ukraine uh, situation. We have teammates affected by all things going on and so we're we're against hate speech we're, we've been supporting uh, the foundation combat anti-semitism which has a broader purview now and trying to help we're trying to educate teammates on how to have the dialogue in the company but you know it, it's what our teammates want it's what's good for the company it's part of who we are and we continue to do it and at the fringes we'll get advice from a lot of people about what's right and right wrong but it's we run the company the way we run the company and um, he was not the only CEO who we've spoken to, by the way, who is holding fast on DEI. You're going to hear from Adina Friedman of NASDAQ as well on that front. But coming up next, we're going to hear from Ian Bremmer. He is really sounding the alarm about wars on a number of different fronts across the globe, including, he says, what we are seeing here in the United States. Before I let you go, we do have some trending tickers to check on. Among them, Goldman Sachs reporting its lowest profit since the beginning of David Solomon's tenure as CEO. Another tough corner for uh, GS. Indeed. All right, we'll be right back.
All right, welcome back to uh, Yahoo Finance's live coverage at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. And Julie, one of the most fascinating chats we had was with Eurasia Group founder Ian Bremer. Of course, uh, Ian talking a lot about geopolitical risk uh, and the potential impact to markets and the economy in light of the results of the Iowa caucus. Take a listen. I think that, uh, look, the media is talking about Nikki Haley, uh, but DeSantis has still been far better known uh, nationally, still is uh, polling uh, in second place. Uh, And uh, this is going to hurt Nikki. She was really trying to make the argument that it's a two-person race. It is not a two-person race. It's a one-person race. Uh, Everybody else is essentially jockeying for cabinet positions and vice president under Trump if he wins. And that is, you know, where the country's going right now. What is the economic risk that you see if we do have uh, a rematch of of Trump and Biden? Um, I don't think there's a... Well, there's a a near-term risk in the sense that once Trump gets the nomination, which is virtually certain, uh, that he will be so much more powerful in the Republican Party. I mean, overnight, he'll have the loyalty of pretty much everybody, the endorsements, the money, the media attention. And that means that his policy pronouncements, to the extent that he makes them, will suddenly have a lot more impact for example, in pushing not to provide any support for the Ukrainians or in giving the Iranians a much tougher run in responding to their support for proxy wars in the region. Do I think that's going to have a big economic impact? Not near term. If Trump wins, of course, last time around there was a positive market impact to Trump winning. Why? Massive near-term deficit spending, markets like that, regulatory rollback, markets like that, uh, and also lower taxation. This time around, that would also be true, but it would be counterbalanced by so much of the concerns of American credibility, uh, even creditworthiness, around a U.S. that is so dysfunctional, so polarized, and where a new McCarthyism could emerge that would really chill red versus blue, including investability of red versus blue states under a Trump-led political administration. That wasn't a risk in 2016. That would be a risk in 2025. But is that a risk that would dissuade a President Trump from doing any of that stuff? No, of course not. So it could happen anyway. Of course. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am curious here in Davos, how many people are talking about the likelihood of a Trump presidency and, and sort of trying to prepare for that already? Uh, everyone's talking about it. I mean, there's a lot of ice out there, <laughs> right under the ice, just under the ice, is sheer panic. Um, on the part of certainly every European leader. You may have seen Christine Lagarde, the head of the ECB, uh, who came out publicly saying that she thought that Trump was a a, a serious uh, risk for Europe, for trade relations, for uh, America's role in the world. She's the only one that said that publicly. Every European leader I'm speaking to privately is concerned. I just had a meeting with a very senior Japanese delegation this morning. That was issue number one, two, and three. And they say, back in Tokyo right now, every CEO, that is what they're worried about. It's not yet dominating the media, but compared to the last two months ago when I was in Tokyo, it's become much more real. I think people were hoping that, you know, it can't really be real. I mean, given 91 indictments and given, you know, all of the legal exposure and the fact that in Washington, D.C., Trump could very easily be convicted before an election, something's going to happen to stop him. No, it's not. No, it's not. The only thing standing in the way of Trump winning is 81-year-old Joe Biden, um, who has a record to run on, uh, but also has a lot of people that feel like he's not actually up to the job. And that is a serious concern for a former president who refused to accept the free and fair transfer of power. I mean, that's existential. It's foundational to any democracy. In any well-functioning democracy, if you had this going on, this would be the number one, two, and three issue. And yet in our country, it's not. What's the conclusion you take from that? It's that our democracy is not well-functioning. It is a democracy in crisis. And yes, that is the top issue being discussed at Davos this year. Well, Ian, I'm I'm hearing you talk about Business leaders potentially pulling back and their level of concern. World leaders maybe not investing in the United States under another Trump presidency to the extent they would. It sounds awful for the U.S. economy. I didn't say that. I, I mean, the U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency. The U.S. is utterly dominant in artificial intelligence. It is a massive food producer exporter, a massive energy producer exporter. Higher production levels than Saudi Arabia right now only going up under Biden would only be going up under Trump. All of these are signs of economic strength. But at the same time, 
the political environment in the U.S. is is more dysfunctional by a long margin than any of the other advanced industrial democracies. No, to the extent this is a huge risk. I mean, yeah, red versus blue, concerns about credit worthiness long term. Yes, that's true. But the bigger concern is for Europe. Of course it is. Because if you're the Europeans, and, and you face a Trump who considers President Zelensky a personal and political enemy because he refused to go after Biden and Hunter when Trump demanded it. Trump has consistently said he's going to end the war in the first day. The way he does that is he says, here is the outcome that I demand that you accept, which is completely unacceptable to the Ukrainian leadership. It's accepting essentially a partitioned Ukraine for a ceasefire. When that happens, he cuts off aid. Now, that will split NATO. That will split the EU. You've got the Poles and the Balts and the Nordic states who will be existentially opposed to U.S. policy. But you'll also have the Hungarians and the Serbs and maybe the Italians who will say, wait a second, we're paying a lot for this. Let's, let's work with Trump. Let's find a way to work with Russia. That's not the U.S. pulling out of NATO, but that's NATO fragmenting. That's the EU fragmenting. This is the biggest risk that the Europeans have seen since the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. It is that big of a deal. And that's coming at a time when the Europeans are also paying far more for energy. They're having a real hard time continuing present levels of industrialization. They're facing significant fiscal challenges. And then you're going to throw Trump on top of that in the middle of a Russia-Ukraine war? We haven't talked about the Middle East, right? This is, this is such a problem for the Europeans. Absolutely, this is the top issue they're talking about right now. And there's so much more I want to talk to you about, but I, I do have to ask about something we talked about off camera a little bit. And I said, as you were enumerating some of what's going on in the world, I said, things are always sort of chaotic in the world. Unless people get sort of uh, apathetic or complacent, you said, no, it's not. This is worse. Yeah, this is worse. And so I just wanted to put a fine point on that. In your view, what is happening in the globe right now and why it is worse and why people need to pay attention. Because we have three wars going on right now. Uh, we have, and, and none of them have guardrails. None of them have diplomatic efforts to try to reduce or contain the tensions. Russia versus Ukraine, 83 countries getting together just a couple of days ago in Davos went absolutely nowhere. The Russians not participating, the Chinese not participating. Uh, they're not going to accept being partitioned, but that is the reality of where we're heading. Uh, you've got a Middle East war that continues to expand. It is not being contained to Gaza. The Americans are deeply isolated in their position supporting Netanyahu. That's not going to change anytime soon. And then you have the U.S. versus itself. And you have Democrats and Republicans that exist in different information spaces on everything, right? And that's a, it's not a civil war, but it's a very deep and existential fight among the, in the most powerful country in the world today. That, that is, we, we are used to that in the United States because it's been happening incrementally over decades and then a little more quickly over the last couple of years. But let us not kid ourselves about the unprecedented nature of what we're seeing in the U.S. political system virtually every day. We cannot normalize that. Our allies will not normalize that. Our adversaries will take advantage of that. That is what we're talking about here. Now, there are plenty of good things happening in the world. There's massive developments in AI and new climate transition. Energy technologies are becoming affordable at scale. The U.S.-China relationship a little better managed than it has been. India looks great right now. I mean, I can, we could do an entire segment just on the positive stuff, but you know, we've known each other for a while. Geopolitically, this is by far the worst environment in my lifetime. Well, we'll have to talk to Ian another time with that more positive spin. But coming up next, we're going to be speaking to the CEO of Accenture, Julie Sweet. She's been talking here in Davos about AI and jobs. Before we let you go, though, we got some more trending tickers for you, including AMD. It's a top trending ticker on Yahoo Finance. And analysts getting more bullish there, including folks at Barclays and Susquehanna, raising their price targets on the stock. They said the outlook for the year ahead looks good. The next big thing from AMD is likely a guidance raise on AI orders sometime soon. We'll see.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance's coverage of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. That's Brian Sazi next to me. I'm Julie Hyman. As we've been telling you, there's a lot of conversation about AI on the ground here. And one of the subtopics is the intersection of AI and jobs and the worries that people globally have that AI is going to eliminate their jobs. One of the folks who is talking about that is Julie Sweet, the CEO of Accenture. She's sitting right, right next to us right now. So let's bring her into the conversation. This is something you talked about at the World Economic Forum today on the stage. Um, so what are the takeaways for people who are concerned? And I should mention, you have a lot of employees at Accenture, 740,000, as you just told me. So, you know, there obviously this is something very much on your mind right now. Right, well, let's just start with, we have 12 jobs in our technology department that didn't exist a year ago. One of them, for example, a prompt engineer. And why does that matter? So the big challenge today about being successful in the use of AI is actually going from the cool demos to operationalizing it and talent is front and center. And in almost every way that you're gonna use it, whether it's to reimagine marketing or digital manufacturing, there's some jobs that are gonna go away, but there are gonna be some brand new jobs. For example, in sales, there's something called a sales bot manager didn't exist before. It's managing all of the bots that are being used to feed new information. So what's really important is to understand how is the Gen AI going to change your talent? What are the new skills? And then, and that's why it's about Davos, right, is how do you make sure that we can bring people along the journey to get those new jobs? Well, that's, that's my question. I mean, are these considered to be highly skilled jobs? What kind of training? And in some ways, does it make some of these jobs more accessible? Well, the, the, the job impact is a couple things. So lots of jobs are going to get better. So like in sales, for example, where you spend a lot of time sifting through information, those are more interesting jobs. So that is an important impact because actually what we find, our research says, a lot of people want Gen AI because they see that. Like, hey, I don't want to read all this stuff. I want to go spend more time with customers. Many of the jobs that are being created are definitely highly skilled jobs, and we see that at Accenture. I think what's the most important takeaway that, you know, we're, we're actually um, have 150 clients who've signed up to do workshops here. So not attend a panel, but actually roll up their sleeves. And the focus there and in every one of them is, what do you have to do to actually be able to create or or actually have the people here be upskilled. And what you have to have is a very different kind of HR capacity. You have to be able to look at skills. And we have 740,000 people. We have a database of our skills. When the pandemic hit, I could run an algorithm and identify who could be upskilled in 20 hours to do more cloud. I mean, that's the future. And by the way, Jenny, I enables that future. How prepared are companies for downside risks from AI? Very early days. So, um, you know, I ask a simple question to CEOs. Can you call someone in your organization and ask them where AI is being used, what are the risks, and how they're being managed? Most CEOs today cannot do that, less than 2%. So what we're doing and is helping CEOs know how do you move from lots of principles, there's a stack of information about what principles should be, to how do you operationalize it? So when you're you know, going to do something in sales, you need to know, well, I have risks around bias. So what is that risk? So you have to get to operationalizing it very early days. What we're doing, we're working over 700 projects, is we're doing it project by project while we help our clients build out the capability. But Gen AI, it, you know, is a very important technology. Reinvention is real, and what that means is there are things that don't exist today, like responsible AI capabilities, that need to be built. And so, how do we do that? <laughs> well, you can hire Accenture, so that's one way. <laughs> but, do, um, but do things also need to happen on the government level, on the policy level? I mean, I know there's been a lot of discussion around that as well. The answer is yes and yes, right? So it first starts with, because you can't wait for policy. So what we first say to clients is, to, is that you have to understand, you know, you, you set aside principles, but then you understand, so what, are, what do you have to do? So it's very simple. At Accenture, if someone wants to use AI, it automatically gets routed to a capability that assesses the risk. That is something every company needs to have. That is not a mystery. It's not a capability they have now, but they have to do it. And what I think is important is that in every workshop that we have, all of the CEOs, all of the C-suite are super focused on this point. They said, 
we want to understand what it looks like, not, not the principles, but that's practical. That means my CIO needs to have that capability. I think you're going to see, you know, we'll come back in a year and we're going to have a very different conversation. It's not going to be less than 2% of companies. Companies are really focused on that. And on the flip side, now government's got to have to think about what do they need to do in terms of regulation, uh, which will be mostly around the use cases. Uh, but it starts now, and you can't wait to the regulation. This sounds like a major profit unlock for a company like Accenture. Do you think investors are under underestimating your earnings power in a world where you're advising companies around the world on how to take advantage of AI? Well, we have very long-term investors who've been with us for a long time, and I think they see uh, the power of Accenture. We succeed by embracing and actually leading every technology change. And we did that with software as a service. We did that in you know private and public cloud. And we're moving very fast here. And we were super proud. Just think about how fast this is moving. It's small on the one hand. Last year, $72 billion in sales, 300 million in Gen AI in the last six months. But in my first quarter of this year, 350 million. So just think about that. It went from 100 million to 200 million to 350 million. So it's moving very, very fast. At the same time, you know, I did $72 billion of sales last year. So it is big and small. Uh, it's happening fast. And just remember, reinvention is real, but you only get to reinvention. You only get all these great outcomes if you can actually reinvent every part of what you do. And that's what the workshops are about. They're what is the process change? What is the talent? What are the new skills? What is responsible AI? What do I have to change about my technology? We are working on 700 projects and the biggest issue that we see is that people are once again doing proofs of concept and they're not sure how to go from a cool demo to actually making that material impact. And of course, that's our opportunity and we're really focused. That's why we did something totally different here this year at Davos. As you know, usually it's a lot of one-on-ones and a lot of panels. And we said people don't need panels right now. They need to understand the biggest difference in success will be leaders. Do leaders truly understand the technology so they can make the right decisions? These are some very big order numbers, large amount of projects. How many people will you hire this year at Accenture to support these goals? Well, I, I look at it a, a different way. We started with 40,000 people who were deeply steeped in data and AI, and we're going to double that in three years. And we're well on our way to doing that. Uh, and, you know, that's just the beginning. All right. Well, uh, leave it there. Uh, Accenture CEO Julie Sweet, thanks for giving us some time. I know these are very busy weeks. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, guys, uh, straight ahead, we'll talk to Stiefel's longtime CEO, Ron Krusevsky, uh, on all things uh, banking, the economy, and interest rates. So we are looking forward to that conversation. But before we get to that combo, let's look at a trending ticker, and that would be Boeing. Of course, uh, all eyes on Boeing. Uh, a challenging few weeks for that company, uh, and will probably be a challenge, challenging few quarters. We'll be right back.
All right, welcome back to Yahoo Finance's live coverage here at Davos, Switzerland, at the World Economic Forum. Uh, lots of focus on a potential economic soft landing, the director direction of rates and markets, you name it. Uh, we have a very great guest to talk about all of those things. Stiefel CEO Ron Krushevsky. Ron, it's been a while. Good to see you in person. It has. It has been a while. Is this your first Davos with the it CEO of Stiefel? What, 27 years? 27 years. I finally made it to Davos. What do you think? Okay? <laughs> good, good. Look at this. I mean, I'm coming uh, back. It's all right? nice. All right. Well, good, good to see you here. And give us your sense on how fast the Fed you, you think will move in terms of cutting rates. We can't get a real great answer. Some people say we might get four rate cuts this year. Some are in the sixth camp. How do you see it? You know, I think I'm probably on that. Well, I am uh, that the Fed will cut less than the market thinks and not as soon as the market thinks. So you'll be able to have me back on in March and say, <laughs> hey, you are dead wrong. But there's a couple, I, you know, we see it that uh, they'll cut. Uh, toward the end of the year. And the reason why is because the economy is doing well. Earnings are going up. Uh, the definition of a soft landing would be that the Fed could cut while the economy is strong. But the reason I uh, tapped those expectations down a little bit is that the Fed really was concerned about inflation, witnessed the 500 basis point increase. It was, it was every other month we were raising rates. And I don't see the Fed uh, just saying, oh, we've solved the problem by March. I don't. Now, again, I can be wrong, but uh, uh, I, I think not. So we'll see. But it sounds like you are optimistic about a soft landing at the same time. You know, I am, uh, you know, and, and, and not to, not to you know, make anyone feel depressed or anything, but, you know, out of uh, every uh, hard landing starts with a soft landing. So you can think mm. about that. And, and the answer <laughs> is, is that, yes, everything is set up, but there's so many variables that we don't know, uh, and mostly geopolitical, that can uh, unrail the best laid plans of mice and men. Why did you feel the need to be at this Davos after 27 years? You know, I think it's it. I wanted to come, uh, you know, this is interesting, and Davos is, uh, it's phenomenal, all the events, uh, but it's also sort of the epicenter of globalization. And if anything that we're facing in the world today, it's, it's the uh, unraveling potentially of Bretton Woods and, and the deal with the United States made, we will protect the world, we will open up markets. And I was interested to see how that would play here. And, and while it's not number one on the agenda concerns, in every meeting I've been in, that's what people are talking about, is what happens in the South China Sea, what happens with Putin, what happens with the United States in, in an era where we've had 80 years of relatively calm geopolitical. I mean, you, all, you have your regional skirmishes, but uh, I would say that that's uh, interesting. I, and that was what I was here to say. What were they going to say? What does it mean if if the U.S. becomes more isolated? Should there be a change in the administration? What does it mean to markets? Well, I mean, again, we've uh, we've had uh, 80 years of, of, of uh, cooperation uh, amongst the countries that are part of uh, Bretton Woods, that agreement. But if you think about it, uh, if you start uh, throwing um, sand in the gears, which is what would happen, protectionism, uh, tariffs, uh, these are all things that are going against that. And to me, it will um, it'll impact prices. All right, it, it won't be as easy to have container ships, you know, just in time uh, going through the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal as, as efficiently as they have. If we change the, uh, the fabric, which was the United States protect the seas and you trade with me fairly. That, that's, you know, but again, you're supposed to think big here at Davos and, uh, and that's kind of what's going, that's what's being talked about. Yeah, so when you say that geopolitics is the thing that maybe could unravel the markets this year, what do you think is the riskiest of the, I mean, there's a lot, unfortunately, to choose from right now. Is it the U.S. election? Is it the wars that we're seeing, which haven't seemed to derail the markets yet? What do you think? You know, well, you know, if I knew, <laughs> I wouldn't be sitting here, okay? I would be doing that. It's it's always something you don't expect mm -hmm. that would do it. So I don't want to try to predict. But, for example, um, you know, something that really impacts oil. So an oil shock would be something that's not, you know, not in the markets. Also, um, outside of geopolitical, uh, again, uh, I'm not so sure that inflation is completely tamed and you have no rate decreases, that the market's not expecting that. Uh, but generally speaking, I'm optimistic about 24. Ron, we have a lot of 
new people coming into the Yahoo Finance uh, ecosystem, a lot of the next generation investors, this is their first time interacting with you. How do you become the CEO of a big, big bank that's not on Wall Street for 27 years? Clearly, you have some secret that you can share. Well, you start when it's a small bank, okay? okay. So, I, so when I took the job, no one else would take it. And uh, I always tell the story, there were four candidates for the job, including me. The other three turned it down. So I, I was able to get the, the job. But, you know, Stiefel's grown from $100 million in revenue to $4.5 billion. And uh, what I would say is that all the young people that are watching this, um, you know, you can become the CEO of any company if, if you so put your mind to it. I'm very uh, encouraged, especially the young people in our firm uh, that uh, are learning, especially this AI and, and all of that. That That is such an opportunity for people, to, young people to learn to be more productive than I ever was. Ron Krzyzewski, thank you so thank much you. for coming to see us. I'm sure you have a very, very busy schedule here. I will come back and scare you. Scare? <laughs> I'm not a skier. Oh, oh, come on. Are you a skier? I'm a Ivy. Hey, we sponsor the U.S. ski team, and, I nice. am a, uh, and I'm a big skier, so i got to find a way to get out there and go down that hill. <laughs> okay. I, I, where there's a will, there's a way, Ron. <laughs> right. I have, I have right. faith in you. Thank All right, you. we don't leave you there. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, we're going to take a quick break. Before we do, we got to show you one more trending ticker. That is Uber. Brian Saucy is quite sad because the company is shutting down its alcohol delivery. I want some whiskey. Drizzly. It delivered bought, to my house. Well, I can't get that anymore, Julie. It bought the service Uber, three years ago job. for $1.1 billion, and it's going to discontinue it by March. So you Here, let me a, stock up now. You have a little bit of time left. All right, well, we've got much more <laughs> now who Finance Live coming your way.
PepsiCo is the drink of choice here at the World Economic Forum in 2024. And lucky us uh, for here for us here at Yahoo Finance, we are joined by PepsiCo Chairman and CEO Ramon Aguarto. Ramon, good to get some time with you. And yes, it is a top product here. I've been drinking it all week. Yeah, it's good. That's why you have so much energy. <laughs> yeah, but, so it's a good point. So talk to us about some of the priorities for, for you uh, here on the ground at the World Economic Forum. Uh, this, is, this is a very important week for us. It's an important week in terms of uh, learning, especially. So uh, it's a unique opportunity for me to see people from different industries, get across across industry, understanding of what's going on around the world, geopolitics, uh, forecasting for economy. But then from the uh, from the PepsiCo out, uh, our focus is food systems transformation. We want to. We've been working on food systems transformation for a long time. As you know, we're a large food company, you mentioned Pepsi, but we are we have Lay's, we have Doritos, we have Quaker, we have many other brands. So food is a large part of our business. We think that the food system needs to be transformed to make it sustainable, to make it um, you know profitable for the farmer and, and, and that's that's something we've been working on for a long time. Um, it, the transformation will happen one farmer at a time. And uh, a lot of our efforts is uh, convening an ecosystem of players that can help transforming that farmer one you know one at a time technical understanding financial knowledge cultural uh, disruption for them in how they adopt new practices that will make them more sustainable long term will protect the soil and will, will make agriculture more more sustainable and that that's our focus for this for this week I, th I think um, I think most sane people could agree climate change is a thing as that continues and in some cases get worse over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, is there a way to protect the PepsiCo business? Well, I, that, that's why we're so intentional about the uh, agriculture and the food system. Um, you know, at the end, we will be successful 20 years from now if we have resilient agriculture everywhere we play. So that, that's one of the elements. Of course, then we need to evolve our portfolio to make it sustainable for people, make sure that is uh, great tasting and nutritious and, and, and everything else. It is, there is, uh, there is a, um, obviously, waste management and everything else. Those are, those are areas where we're very focused as well. And we, we want to create the uh, right momentum politically and financially to build a uh, recycling infrastructure, which in many countries around the world is in existence, including the U.S., where we have great opportunities to build a consumer understanding, but most importantly, the uh, infrastructure to take, you know, ways back into, you know, companies like ours that we're, we're willing to recycle, we're willing to... Uh, our bottles to be 100% our pet versus, uh, you know, 30% or 20% that we have today in some parts of the of the portfolio. We were uh, talking to the, the CEO of NASDAQ, Adina Friedman, uh, on the ground here at the World Economic Forum, and she was talking about the remake of her company, a lot of focus on technology, and I, it made me think about what you have done under your leadership at PepsiCo, a series of big acquisitions. I think back to, to Rockstar, it's a brand that mm -hmm. I know, taking a stake in Celsius, another product that I consume around the clock uh, virtually. Why are you making some of these deals, and, and how... What is triggering them ultimately? Well, in, in our strategy of transformation of the portfolio or new capabilities that we need to, as you were saying, successful 20 years from now, there's a lot of things we can do ourselves. There's a lot of things that make more sense to go and acquire. For example, one that I'm, I'm very proud of and I think is going to pay for us long term is SodaStream. SodaStream is a is a platform that would allow us to transform the, uh, our beverage business. And I, I believe that long term we'll be able to empower consumers to create their own drinks and to uh, you know, combine it in ways that they like and, and we will eliminate plastic, we'll eliminate a lot of uh, you know, unnecessary logistic costs and things that create uh, you know, pollution. And, and those are, it is very difficult for us to create a solid stream. So we need to go and acquire a solid stream. And there's, there's more cases like that where, um, you know, if you, if you buy on a scale business, then your business focuses on that platform and it's much easier to develop. A lot of our strategic choices, we make them uh, from PepsiCo out. So we develop ourselves, we have great R&D capabilities, we have other capabilities that allow us to build businesses, new brands from zero. Um, and, and so it's a combination of both platforms, how we think about the future of the company. How did the pandemic change how you think about making products? I really, I think you gave me the term in your last earnings call, you called it unstructured meals. I never heard that before. Well, uh, th that is, I don't think the pandemic changed that. I think this has been a, uh, a global trend for many years. If you think about lifestyle evolutions and, and urbanization and dual income families and all that, unstructured meals means that more and more calories are being eaten in not informal sit-down meals with the full family. And, and I think we, 
we have a unique opportunity to uh, build the right set of uh, solutions for consumers as they think about nutrition, convenience, taste, that, that triangle that is very, that is very strategic. Um, so we, yeah, we think that that is a, a big idea for us. We think our brands belong in food meals. You know, our, a lot of consumers think about our brands as snacks. And I think our brands belong in meals more and more. And uh, that, that's where we're evolving on some of our innovation to provide consumers with more um, satiating solutions that you know, uh, basically you know, you're substituting a meal with, with some of our products. You've done your, uh, a large part of your life's work here at PepsiCo. You've taken sugar out of, out of products, you've reduced calories, salt content, and uh, really pivoted to better for you products in the, in the Frito-Lay business, for example. Does it bother you that a lot of these products are being called ultra-processed, and, and what does that word even mean to you? Yeah, and, and um, I, I, I don't like the word ultra-processed, and I don't believe in it. I think um, we are um, using kitchen logic to define our product. So what we're trying to do is, you know, things that consumers do at home, we want to do it at scale in our large plants. So we call our plants actually large kitchens. And the people that work in the lines, when you talk to them, they'll, they'll call themselves cooks. So we're using kitchen logic to say we, we have, we, we can give consumers great tasting products, nutritious, uh, as you said, we've been at this for many, many years. And, and this debate of vilifying anything that is packaged goods almost and call it ultra processed, I think it's, it's not going to help us move um, you know, to what is food safety and what is uh, giving people food around the world. So it's a debate that is a little bit um, nuanced and we, we have to bring clarity in what is ultra processed. I don't think our products are at all ultra processed. Our products are follow kitchen logic and are just a good package solutions for consumers that need solutions throughout the day around the world. Does that debate push you and your team to move even faster, reinventing products? Yes, yes. And, and I think it's, it's uh, we've been at this for many years, but in the last few years we've accelerated even more the transformation of our portfolio. So um, you, you will see in the U.S. Uh, Lay's ready salted that are below WHO levels of sodium. And that's something that three years ago we wouldn't even we're, we were scared to do it. We thought the consumer would be very negative. The consumer is actually embracing these, these solutions at scale, in, uh, including countries like the U.S. where the levels of sugar and salt are higher than other parts of the world. So we're very, we feel very strong and we feel very, um, like we, I think we have the solutions to, uh, to how we transform our portfolio into better, better, better options with the same great taste, which I think is the, is the, is the intersection that the consumer is looking for. And no impact from, from weight loss drugs. I mean, there's, these drugs to me seem confined to the East Coast, West Coast. There's, well, the whole middle America is still consuming your products. Do you see any impact from that yet? Well, the, um, I think the East Coast and the West Coast also consume our product. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm happy, I can attest to that. I'm happy for that. But so the, the, uh, the, the, the obesity drugs, we've been studying this for a long time now. Uh, there's still a lot of unknowns of how, how big this could be, the level of adoption and how fast it could go. Uh, our current assumptions is that this will be a long-term, if anything, adoption in the U.S. Um, and that also the consumers that we're seeing uh, taking the drugs, they have a very balanced diet. And actually they continue to eat our snacks on, and, and our drinks. And so the, our portfolio is almost naturally hedged against the uh, consumer behavior changes that we're observing with when people adopt the, uh, uh, the drugs. And, and, and it's, it's going to be a, a small burn, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. So we will have time to continue to double down on our R&D capabilities, evolve the portfolio, maybe even accelerate if needed. Or as you were saying, there could be M&A opportunities that we can use to complement some of the uh, um, maybe protein spaces where we have some brands but maybe not enough or some other opportunities that we might see in the portfolio as we understand better what are the behavioral changes that, that consumers have when they take these, um, these sort of uh, medications. I told you off camera, PepsiCo is one of the first companies I wrote about as a young reporter. I think I'm f 15 years in to covering this company and I've always been amazed by the consistency and performance. And one stat that I came across recently, you have beaten your earnings estimates by 55, in 55 straight quarters. Like That's not yeah. even normal. But I think to do that, it says a lot about leadership and it says a lot about your leadership at the company. Talk to us about how you lead a company like PepsiCo, a global company like PepsiCo. You know, some of your, I guess, tips some, of success. Some, some, some principles that I have. Yeah. I the, the, the one principle, as you said, talk, they mentioned the word global. 
I think we are actually a set of local companies. Uh, and, and, and the way I think about us uh, in the marketplace is a, we need to win in 200 markets where we participate and the equation for success in every market is different. So I want to have very empowered general managers that think end to end about how to optimize the cost structure, the portfolio, uh, the talent base that we have to win in that market. That is enabled by a global company in technology, data, values, culture, uh, you know, uh, obviously financial capabilities, but that, that's the way I think about the company. Now, I think also about the company with, with a concept that I use in my life all the time, which is perform to potential. I, I think you know, my, my role is to help the organization reach its potential all the time, which means every individual needs to be inspired to reach its potential and the teams need to be inspired to reach its potential, which, you know, is not easy, but, but it's, it's a good mental model on how you drive an organization. Another principle of mine is uh, big changes to big things. And, you know, uh, it, which you've done at PepsiCo. It, yeah, and, and, it's, and it's, it's sometimes it, it's, it's, not, it's not easy because obviously there is, there is a, uh, a risk aversion in the teams. And, and, but, so, but you can inspire people to make big changes to big things, take bigger risks, and reach the potential of the company. So that's how I'm thinking about, about the organization. I like transparency. I like trust. I like empowerment. I think those are ways where, how you run an organization of our scale in today's world. Because the truth is that the last four years, five years, have shown us that you cannot run a company from a central point. This is a, there's so much going on, and there's local events, that you just mentioned some geopolitics, you know, devaluations, I mean, everything happening. You cannot have a company run from a point of central point. You need to you know, empower the organization to, uh, to run it. And we have great people. We have great talent. We've always been investing in people. Um, you know, I came from the bottom of the company and I know the kind of people we have and how important they are to the success of the company. And I believe that, for example, AI will help us become an even more empowered company. You know, we'll be able to move more decision making, more information to the uh, front line and they will really um, you know, be, be the owners of a lot of decisions. They make you know, many, many decisions every day. If we can help them make better decisions every day, you know, the company will be better. So th those are philosophies on how I run the business and, you know, uh, I'll, uh, they, they are a bit my personality and my, my I guess, my experience. Well. No, it's a real treat to get uh, some time with you here at the World Economic Forum. Uh, Ramon LaGuardia, Chairman and CEO of PepsiCo. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you very much, Brian.
We may be far away from Washington here in Davos, Switzerland, but we are still watching the Federal Reserve, of course, and the U.S. economy. So let's talk about the outlook for rates and the global economy as well as the U.S. economy uh, with Ann Wall. She's CIO at Guggenheim Partners Investment Management, which has about $225 billion in assets under management. Ann, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being with us here. Um, so we've been talking to a lot of folks about the idea of the soft landing. And, um, you know, I know that you were somewhat skeptical at certain points that, that we were going to be able to achieve it. Where are you now on that question? Well, I remain in the skeptical camp. Um, I think that uh, that we've seen the yield curve being inverted for 300 plus days uh, is uh, a precursor to recession historically. Um, and our view is, is that we are going to see a mild recession. Um, we're not going to see the big pandemic or, or global financial crisis kind of recession, just a good old fashioned slowdown in business. Um, the soft landing idea is based on a belief that we'll be able to uh, manage to have a below trend growth, so below 2% GDP, uh, but not yet fall into recession. We're, we're just a little bit uh, more concerned that the economy will slow down more than that soft landing view. Hmm. So Ann, if you are in that, that mild recession outlook, are you in the camp of six rate cuts this year? Yes, we are. And we're in the camp that they begin in March which is more aggressive now that it seems like a lot of the uh, uh, market peers are, are believing. Um, we think the inflation story is definitely a good one at this point in time. Inflation is coming down. The trajectory is in the right direction. Um, I know CPI print was uh, elevated, but that was driven a lot by um, owner equivalent rent. And that component is stubbornly holding up relative to the PPI, which definitely showed us the direction and trend for inflation is down. And so we believe that that's still going to hold for the rest of this year. Do you think that there will be not just more signs of inflation coming down by the time that March meeting rolls around, but also si more signs of cracks in the economy becoming apparent? And if so, what would those be? So I think of the economy as almost two economies now. It's very bifurcated. There's the big companies, the big market participants. They all seem to be doing pretty well. They're coming into this slowdown cycle with a tailwind. And the tailwind is they've been able to pass along their higher costs, their margins have been protected, and they have access to capital. However, the small and mid-sized businesses in the U.S., which make up about 50% of the GDP, I think that's a different story. They're going to be having to refinance as a refinancing wall is coming with uh, commercial and industrial loans, particularly in small and mid-sized banks. Uh, and they're going to be refinancing at much higher rates, particularly relative to what the big participants can borrow at. They're still borrowing at prime, 8.5 to 10% or more for those small and mid-sized businesses, if they can access the capital at all. Otherwise, you know, particularly for small businesses, they may be forced into credit card borrowing. So s potentially six rate cuts beginning in March, slowing economy. You know, a lot of the investors that we talk to for Yahoo Finance, they have a whole portfolio of tech stocks that they still own from the back half of 2023. To those investors, what should they, how do they build a portfolio to withstand the environment you're talking about? Well, it's sort of interesting as we sit here in Davos, um, it seems like the theme this year is technology and particularly artificial intelligence, as it has been in the stock market, certainly in 2023. And I think that theme will continue. Um, I'm a bit more concerned that there will be some softness in the stock market overall. Um, and technology is one of those kinds of uh, mispriced uh, elements of the market. The markets tend to over price in the short run and underprice in the long run. And I tend to think of it in the long run as being a really good story to tell. But that doesn't mean there won't be with, uh, you know, some volatility in between. And, uh, and so I would anticipate that investors who want to hold on for the long term, absolutely, the story is a good one. But in the short run, you're going to have to probably see some, some downtrend in do, pricing. Do you add fixed income and, and what allocation in your portfolio should be fixed income? Fixed absolutely. Income. Fixed income has historically done very well when the Fed has paused mm -hmm. and begins their easing cycle, which is exactly where we find ourselves. We think that rates are going to continue to fall. In addition to the short end, we think the long end will come down and that the 10-year Treasury will come down to about 3.5%. And so if we're going in that direction, fixed income, particularly investment-grade fixed income, is going to perform very well in that environment. Um, how does all of what you're saying seg with what you're hearing here in Davos, right? Because you know, the vibe on the global economy, I know that the, the World Economic Forum's own survey of chief economists found, what, 56% expect a global economic slowdown. So how, what are you hearing here that sort of stands out to you on that front? 
Well, I hear cautious optimism about so many aspects of the economy, both in the U.S. and globally. And I think that sort of falls into my large companies are going to do well mm -hmm. theme. Um, and then there's going to be some uh, performers that aren't, you know, players that aren't going to perform quite so well in the economy. That is what I'm hearing here as well. The other element is globally there's a slowdown. We saw uh, Germany's numbers this morning, and that's the second quarter in a row that they've seen negative GDP. We also see China slow uh, at this point in time. So globally the story is definitely below trend growth, likely close to or, or, or you know, seeing recessionary-like uh, uh, backdrop. There seems to be a lot of, uh, a good amount of concern on the ground here uh, at Davos about the election, the potential election, not only the outcome, but in the months leading up to it. Is rising geopolitical risk, is that the trigger point for the, for the market sell-off you just suggested? Well, what we're seeing right now in markets is generally increased tail risk. So overall, we have more idiosyncratic risk. We have more specific risk to individual entities. We have more geopolitical risk. All of these elements could certainly lead to, dare I say, some sort of a gray swan event, um, but that's not our current base case. Our current base case is, is that, um, that, uh, that these geopolitical events will continue to unfold, but not create some sort of a, a, a huge sell-off themselves. Also, markets do a very bad job of predicting and pricing in geopolitical risk until that's the rear view mirror uh, kind of uh, environment. So as a result, we're looking for it. We're always being thoughtful, but because of that backdrop, tail risk is higher. I like that. Gray swan. And Walsh, great to catch up with you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. From iPhones and iPads to Macs, Apple Watches, and AirPods, Apple's products are a daily necessity for millions, and the numbers prove it. The company generated more than $394 billion in revenue in 2022 alone. But how were they able to achieve such staggering success? Beyond the ticker charts its path to becoming a tech giant. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak founded Apple in Los Altos, California in 1976. That same year, Wozniak built the company's first product, the Apple One. Apple debuted the Macintosh with its now iconic 1984 commercial during Super Bowl 18. The Macintosh stood out because it was the first mass market personal computer to feature a graphical user interface and mouse. Jobs left Apple after his famous falling out with CEO John Scully in 1985 and subsequently founded the next computer company. In 1991, Apple introduced the PowerBook line, which set the standard for most modern laptops. In 1996, after a run of CEOs, Jobs returned to Apple. The company purchased Next to use its operating system and named Jobs interim CEO in 1997. Apple introduced the iMac in 98, and the line would go on to sell millions of units. Three years later, Apple debuted its first iPod, which could store roughly a thousand songs. And that same year, the company opened its first Apple stores. But it was in 2007 that Apple unveiled its most important product of all, the iPhone. A revolutionary device, the iPhone helped create an entire business model around apps and the App Store. Jobs suffered from pancreatic cancer towards the end of his second term as CEO. He resigned from the company just before his death, and Tim Cook took over as CEO in 2011. In 2015, Apple took the wraps off of its first new device since Cook took over as head of Apple, the Apple Watch. Just seven years later, Apple became the world's first publicly traded company to reach a market cap of $3 trillion. And in June 2023, the company unveiled its most ambitious product yet, the Vision Pro. A mixed reality headset, the Vision Pro is scheduled to launch in early 2024.
Welcome back. Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley out with earnings this morning. Goldman beating Wall Street expectations, capping a year of transition for the bank. Earnings surged 51 percent during the fourth quarter, driven by a jump in its equities trading division. But for the year, it was a different story. The, boat, the bank posted its lowest annual profit since 2019. And we got a disappointing report from Morgan Stanley. Fixed income and equities trading revenue that fell short of forecasts, and the bank warned of lower margins in its wealth business. Here to break it all down, we've got Saul Martinez, who is the HSBC head of U.S. Financials. Great to have you here with us, Saul. Help us kind of perhaps paint a broad stroke on the bank earnings that we've seen come forth so far. And was that, what does that say about the setup for the rest of this earnings season? Yeah, uh, well, thank you for having me. I think you do have to distinguish between the commercial and universal banks and the investment banks. But I think in general, this earnings season is less about the quarterly results themselves and more about what the results and what management teams are saying about the outlook for 2024. And, I, and really it's about, if you had to encapsulate it, it's really about revenue growth and the return to revenue growth. So we obviously had, uh, you know, uh, we had Goldman and Morgan Stanley today. We also had JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup and Wells on Friday and PNC today as well. And I think it, it's a very mixed picture on revenue growth, especially for traditional banks. You 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 um, you have you know, J.P. Morgan and Citi giving guidance that was a little bit higher than street expectations, but the commentary from J.P. Morgan was that net interest income would fall during the course of the year and exit the fourth quarter at a lower rate. Uh, Wells Fargo gave pretty cautious commentary about net interest income. Uh, PNC's guidance today was was you know uh, calling for a decline. So it's still a really tepid environment there for loan growth, we're still seeing deposit cost pressure. So we're still not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of revenue dynamics. I think with Goldman and Morgan Stanley, uh, you know, their business models are a little bit different. I think you have to look at them individually. Uh, you know, I think Goldman's, you know, outlook uh, and Goldman's results, I, I would say, I think were reinforced the turnaround and the, um, the, the, the transformation that they're seeing where they're looking to um, uh, reconfigure their asset and wealth management business, right. uh, where they're reducing losses in their consumer business and continuing to gain share and position themselves well for a rebound in investment banking. Whereas Morgan Stanley showed, you know, uh, uh, that wealth management, which is a real big driver for them, still faces some challenges. So a lot going on, but I think really these results and why you're seeing some softness in in the share reactions both Friday and today really has to do with the outlook still being mercury, murky in terms of a revenue recovery. And so to the point is specifically what we're hearing from Morgan Stanley when it comes to the wealth business, Ted Pick on the earnings call this at, or this morning, excuse me, saying that it is the engine for future growth for the banks. When we talk about the fact that this, that this future still certainly looks a bit murky at this point, what do you think that growth then potentially looks like for the wealth division specifically for Morgan Stanley here in the coming months? Yeah, I, I think that that's right. I think for, for Morgan Stanley, keep in mind, they trade at a valuation premium in large part because the wealth management business is such a big contributor to revenue and to earnings. And that's a high multiple, high return revenue stream. It, it's still, you know, I think if you look out over a year, two years, there's some reason for optimism. They're still growing net new assets. One positive in the quarter was that fee-based net new assets did show improvements. And with the market recovery, you would think that clients would start to engage more, would start to put more assets into higher return uh, products that have, uh, you know, um, a higher fee margins. The issue, though, is that in the near term, it's still a bit challenging. Um, you still are seeing pressure on deposits. So the net interest income piece of wealth is under some pressure. And, you know, there, there's still the fee growth is still, you know, lackluster. We downgraded Morgan Stanley last week in large part because you know, we, we've reduced our estimates for Morgan Stanley uh, about 10% since we initiated coverage in September and the stock is, is up over that time period. So you've had multiple expansion. So I, I think the, ne the coming quarters are still gonna be challenging. If you look out a year, two years, the engine is still there, it will grow and hopefully that will help drive margin expansion. I think one thing that was really important on the call today though was that you know, the, Ted Pick, the new CEO, did say that they would maintain, stay at a mid-20% wealth management margin. 
their long-term target is 30. And I think there was some hope that maybe the margins would expand a little bit more and a little bit sooner, but they're, st they're still under pressure and they're still you know, um, uh, not hitting those margin targets that they've set out for themselves. All right, Saul Martinez, we wish we had more time. we got to get you back soon. Thank you so much for breaking down the results that we've got, not only this morning, but also what we heard from J.P. Morgan, from Wells Fargo, from a number of the other large banks on Friday. Saul Martinez, HSBC, head of U.S. Financials. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Well, that's it for us today. Rochelle Akufo and Akiko Vegeta have you for the next hour of trading. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufa alongside Akiko Fujita. Here's a look at what we're watching this morning. The rising fear index, the VIX, signaling volatility expected ahead. This as investors digest more big bank earnings today. Morgan Stanley falling after seeing a drop in profits thanks to a combined $535 million in one-time charges. And Yahoo Finance is on the ground in Davos, Switzerland for the World Economic Forum. Later in the show, our own Brian Zazi and Julie Hyman speak with Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates about spending on health and climate initiatives and whether the Biden administration should do more on the issue. That's right. And after a whirlwind of excitement over spot Bitcoin ETFs, let's check on how they're trading, looking at the Wi-Fi interactive here. As you can see here, looking a lot of red across the board, the only one that you'll see in the green here, BITI is the ticker. That's ProShares, ProShares short Bitcoin ETF. As you can expect, this is actually the only one in the green, but it actually shorts Bitcoin prices. So investors actually benefit when the price of Bitcoin declines. But you've been seeing it's been selling off this morning as we've actually seen Bitcoin ticking up so far this morning. Currently near session highs at above 43,000. Akiko? First, though, Rochelle, let's take a look at where markets are 90 minutes into the trading week. A bit of a catch up session, if you will, after the extended holiday weekend. We've got the Dow down 192 points, the S&P 500 down more than uh, roughly 14 and the Nasdaq down 22. We are watching the energy space closely as we see oil prices pull back here, uh, largely on macroeconomic concerns and that demand picture. WTI crude right now at 71.91. Brent crude uh, futures at 77.81. Also checking the Treasury market. See, we uh, Treasury market. We've seen those yields push higher today. The 10-year yield right at that 4% level right now. The 30-year yield at 4.25, and the five-year on the shorter end, right below that 4% level. Well, we are seeing global equities retreating as central bank leaders push back against aggressive rate cut bets. ECB officials have displayed a somewhat hawkish tone of late, with governing council member Francois Villeroy de Galal saying at the World Economic Forum in Davos that it's too early to declare victory on inflation. Investors are eager to hear more Federal Reserve speakers throughout the week, especially after that hotter-than-expected December inflation reading. First up, Fed Governor Governor Christopher Waller speaking on the economy now at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. So will investors have to accept higher for longer rates? We have Katie Kaminsky, Alpha Simplex chief research strategist and portfolio manager joining us today. Katie, good to talk to you. We are monitoring those comments from Fed Governor Chris Waller, Christopher Waller, uh, saying essentially that we've got to proceed with these rate cuts carefully. How have you been processing all the comments that have been coming through when you consider the expectation that's been running ahead in the markets? Well, this is, I mean, the comments are coming out today exactly how we would think, uh, that they're pointing out that we're not at 2% yet, and that is the goal. Um, and there's no reason at this point to react quickly. I think the market earlier this month had really been hopeful for cuts. Um, this is causing a little, perhaps a little bit of the backup in the fixed income market you're seeing today. Um, but I think we're still really treading water until we figure out when we're going to get to the point of cuts. I mean, it's definitely a wait and see moment uh, in the markets right now. It's true. And, and, and investors certainly ahead over their skis at one point, some of them expecting six rate cuts before we got that very hot December print. But I want to draw your attention to Yahoo Finance. We spoke with Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, about his expectation for rate cuts. So let's hear what he had to say. Our team has four cuts next year and four cuts in 25. And so that gets you down in the three, three and a quarter, three and a percent, three and a half percent uh, range. Um, so that will feel quick, but it's, go, it, it's less the pace is where it stops out. And what, I, what would be good for the U.S. is they could actually get to a normal rate curve, which for 15 years we haven't had. Like for a moment we had it in, in 1819, and then they started cutting rates. People forget it in 19 they had to cut rates to push the economy. So we have that eight cuts over two years. Inflation gets down to the target for the Fed at the end of 25, so it takes some time. And people say it's higher, but in the grand scheme of history, that's not higher. It's just higher since you know, the financial crisis on a global basis rates fell, and now they're coming back up to be a little more. So, Katie, four cuts expected this year, four more in 2025. Does this seem plausible to you? To you? And more importantly, 
the reason that the Fed would have to cut that much, do you think investors are baking that in well enough? Well, I think the challenge is that there's such a wide range of different scenarios that can occur. And I think what's been interesting for us on the technical side, we've been watching the signals um, in fixed income, and we have gone through a massive pivotal shift from short signals to long signals in fixed income. And I want to point out and look at this today. If you look at the yield curve today, it is steepening. So it is doing sort of what is the next phase of this trade. So I think hopefully this is going to be a smooth and steady transition. I think the challenge is that the market wants bigger cuts perhaps than what we might get. So I'd have to agree with um, the CEO of Bank of America there that it's really not just about how many cuts, it's about how far. Um, and we're going to see that steeper yield curve at some point. We're already starting to see indications in the curve as of now. I mean, take a look at that 30-year versus the 10-year today. Um, you're seeing steepening. And that's what most people are looking for as a signal that this is actually happening. So, Katie, if the expectation is that the yield curve will continue to steepen, how do you trade on that? Well, I think the key thing is really sort of you can easily think about doing a steepener trade. So um, being long the short end of the curve for now and short the long end of the curve, um, which is really sort of a view that long term rates are going to have to stabilize higher than shorter term rates. And I think a lot of people are really looking for that trade because what's happened is we went through an inversion in the curve. We went to a flatter yield curve and the next phase of this trade should be a steepener. Um, whether or not it's going to be a steepener because cuts come first or because we have a challenging economic situation, um, we could also see challenge at the long end of the yield curve for various reasons, perhaps excess supply. Um, so a steeper yield curve is the natural next phase. Um, and that's the typical trade for that long, the short end, short, the long end. And Katie, of course, this is coming on the heels of a Q4 tech rally driven by the MAG7. You saw a lot of investors taking their profits, getting comfortable here. What does the next phase look like, especially as we're sort of bracing for this volatile situation here? Well, the challenge is, look at Q4. I mean, you had tremendous performance in the equity market. So we basically made a year or a year and a half of performance in one quarter or less. And so valuations are high. People want the soft landing. But the truth is, to get to that 2%, we need to kind of move through uh, inflation going down. And inflation isn't going to go in a straight line. It's quite possible that we could have upside risk and we could have volatility. So it is tricky to determine at this point, how do you position in a year where things have already gone up quite a bit? And Katie, specifically on positioning, you've talked about commodity prices being a really close one to watch here. We were talking about energy, uh, certainly some concern about disruption in the Middle East, given what's been playing out. But also, it feels like the larger um, mover, if you're thinking specifically about oil, will be about the macro outlook. H how do you view that? And what are some spaces that you're watching? What are names that you're looking at that could potentially move on the back ends of that? So... Energies have been very tricky. They've been bouncing around a lot for the last year. Um, the other challenge is it's been bouncing between this question of demand versus also geopolitical tensions. So you've really seen that narrative bouncing back between those two, particularly in the last quarter. I think the reason energy is so interesting as something to follow is that these tend to be lead indicators for changes in inflation. They tend to be one of the first movers. That's exactly what we saw at the start of the rate cut cycle. Um, when we were starting to see those changes. So I think following energies and following things like um, the crude oil contract and many of those will give us an indication of where there's starting to be some movement. So the fact that oil has been going up recently, but now again today down, um, it's tricky. Uh, we're still seeing short signals in oil, although geopolitical tensions have been causing some uptick in energy prices over concern. Certainly a tough time here, which is why, of course, recommend not trying to time the market. You never know sort of what's going to switch it from one way to the next. I appreciate you joining us this morning. Katie Kaminsky, Alpha Simplex Chief Research Strategist and Portfolio Manager. Thank you so much. Right now, let's take a look at some trending tickers. Tesla shares in focus this morning. CEO Elon Musk saying he wants more voting power at the EV giant. Writing in a post on X, he says he's, quote, uncomfortable growing Tesla to be a leader in AI and robots without having around 25% of voting control.
So Akiko, he does mention in this, in this tweet, in this X, that he wants enough to be influential, but not so much that he can't be overturned. But it does seem to be the case that he's, you know, hinting at potentially building some of these products outside of Tesla. Um, looking at some some big uh, Tesla balls here, we saw commentary from Dan Ives saying the board and Musk will be able to resolve this. He's estimating the next three to six months. I really thinks that the shareholders will be fine. And Musk did praise uh, the Tesla board in that in a following tweet as well and said that he couldn't do it through a compensation package because he still has uh, an outstanding trial in Delaware that's still being resolved. But a, a bit of a power move here, uh, considering some of the issues that Tesla's already been facing with its stock price. Yeah, I mean, a few things to note here. He's looking for 25% control. He has roughly 13% control right now. Also, the fact that he's talking about Tesla becoming a leader in the AI and robotics space seems to be an admission that it's not exactly where it needs to be, despite past Musk comments. But this is certainly going to be a really tricky decision for the board if it does come to that, because this comes at a really, really delicate time for Tesla. When you think about the concerns that shareholders have expressed about Elon Musk splitting time between the companies, Tesla, SpaceX and Twitter, or X, I should mention. Also, at a time when we have seen EV sales soften, there's been a massive move to price cuts because Tesla certainly isn't the only player as well. It's not just a U.S. story. It's also in the biggest EV market over in China. So it's going to be a tricky balance uh, for the board to make that decision if it does come to that, because um, there are concerns about where Tesla is moving, which direction it's moving at a time of increased competition at its core business, which is really still autos. Well, another tech giant in the news this morning, Apple. Reports suggest the company will remove the blood oxygen sensor from its smartwatches to get around a patent dispute with medical technology technology company Massimo. They set a court filing from the health tech company, a story, Rochelle, that we've been following very closely since that deadline passed uh, back in December for Apple to have to take those specific watches off the market as a result of this patent dispute. I, I will point out, by the way, though, uh, we're talking about their wearables. There's another headline that crossed today that to me is kind of interesting on Apple. Apple topping Samsung and global smartphone shipments for the first time in 2023. If you look at the revenue breakdown for Apple, it still is about those iPhones. Certainly a big win for Apple. Yes, backwards looking, but we're still talking about those handsets that are key to the revenue for Apple. It's true. I mean, and you raise a good point because as, as much headlines as we're seeing about the watch, the iPhone really is their, their hero product here. So still making that progress there. And I think Apple really considering... Is, is it really worth us to keep going down this road with Massimo? They've tried to make some of the changes. The courts are looking at that and saying perhaps this might not be enough um, as they're looking at some of the changes they're trying to make, saying it's not just a software issue, it's a hardware issue as well. We'll have to wonder if perhaps they partner with another company on this because health is still at the forefront of Apple's ecosystem here and some of the developments that they want to make, not just with their phones and tracking as well, but they want to push more in this health space. So perhaps they'll find a different avenue to go down, but it appears that, that this route, um, with the blood oxygen sensor involving Massimo, seems a bit of a non-starter here. And finally, also taking a look at Synopsys shares jumping as the software company is set to buy Ansys for $35 billion in the biggest tech deal of the year so far. Now, this will be a cash and stock deal that values Ansys at over $390 a share, which is a 35% premium on the company's 60-day volume-weighted average price as of December 21st. Now, the seal is expected to close in the first half of 2025. Of course, it is still very early in, uh, in 2024. As we say, this is, you know, the biggest tech deal. So still very early in the gates here. And a lot of people wondering what is going to be happening with M&A activity. So interesting to see this here. I mean, the company deals in a lot of different products and services, including tennis rackets. So it'll be interesting to see how, how this benefits them, how this plays out for them. But at least a hint of some positive M&A activity ahead. Yeah, not just the, the largest uh, M&A deal so far in the year, which is just a few weeks old, but really the largest deal in recent years. Certainly a good harbinger of things to come when you think about it. This does create a design software giant, as you described, Rochelle. So uh, if anything, this really is about is this a sign of that thaw that's coming um, with M&A deals potentially picking up uh, some momentum here? You see Synopsys shares up more than 3.5% on this deal. So we'll continue to watch that to see where things go.
Well, coming up, Yahoo Finance is live at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Up next, former Microsoft CEO Bill Gates weighs in on the state of funding for health and climate challenges. What is that time of year again? The World Economic Forum is back in Davos, Switzerland, where the world's top leaders are gathering to discuss key issues facing the economy. Yahoo Finance's Julie Hyman and Brian Sazi had the chance to speak with Bill Gates, former Microsoft CEO and co-chair of the Gates Foundation. He touched on one of the key themes at the annual forum, global climate goals. Take a listen. I want to point to something you wrote about in your Gates notes looking ahead to 2024 when you said this election will be pivotal for the presidential election in the U.S., that is, will be pivotal for climate and health. Can you dig into that a little bit for us? Well, I'm a huge believer in uh, more generosity to poor countries uh, to help them with their climate challenges, so-called climate adaptation, and uh, to drive health. You know, the our biggest R&D budget for health in the world is the U.S. government. R&D budget, the U.S. government, uh, NHIB, you know, under President Bush, uh, created an HIV program called PEPFAR that saved tens of millions of lives. And so the U.S. government is the biggest player. Uh, and, you know, getting a group in that uh, maintains generosity, spends that money well for health challenges and climate challenges, you know, I, I hope uh, we achieve that. And you, okay, do you want to put a fine point on it and tell us which one you think is going to do that? Well, we'll have, you know, administrations that are more or less engaged in those issues. Um, you, you know, think I'm, the current I'm a administration voter, is, is engaged very, in those issues? Yes. I mean, they, in, in both health and, and climate, they've been very engaged. You know, I'm one voter. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you might guess how I'm going to vote, but, uh, you know, we'll, 
we're, we've been able to work with every administration uh, and you know try to get you know it's human charity it's caring it's creating a stable world so hopefully we can make the case no matter who's elected yeah how impactful has the inflation reduction act been to the green movement and the work you do uh, with the foundation the ira has helped these early stage companies that my group called breakthrough energy is uh funded over 100 of those companies and i'd say about 30 of them are able to go build pilot plants aggressively because with the tax credit, they get bootstrapped. So even though at first their technology is expensive, every one of these companies we only put money in is if we know it can get so that the price eventually is the same as the current way of, say, making steel or cement or providing uh, transportation. Um, and one last question, because I know you, you have to run. Um, since you talked about breakthrough, um, I was struck in reading your different recent commentary how optimistic you are. And particularly on climate and energy, it can feel daunting. So where, do, where does that optimism come from? Because it feels like there's not a lot of urgency necessarily around these issues. Well, I, I do worry uh, that things like global health are not as much on the mm. agenda as they should be. You know, everything that's bad, eventually you measure through, through human health. You know, climate is bad if you have more malaria or, or more malnutrition. And so just saying, okay, what are the breakthroughs, whether it's labeled climate or not, to improve the human condition, we should continue to do those. Because of human innovation, We've come a long ways, even since the year 2000. And it's not that visible to people. Uh, and, and yet, you know, emissions per person uh, have gone down. Total emissions are about to peak. Will we hit the deadlines? That's, that's what's at risk. Because of innovation, we'll eventually get emissions down. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I, I do worry that we're going to miss a lot of the, the milestones that we've set for ourselves. That was Bill Gates with our very own Brian Sozzi and Julie Hyman in Davos, Switzerland. All right, coming up, we'll go back to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, where Brian Sozzi and Julie Hyman sit down with former IMF chief economist Kenneth Rogoff. That's after this break.
more than half of chief economists surveyed by the World Economic Forum say the global economy will slow this year. Of course, last year at this time here in Davos, the talk was much the same, and that recession, at least in the U.S., did not materialize. We were hearing a lot of optimism, meantime, from CEOs. So let's talk about the risks to the global economy, whether in fact a recession is coming. Kenneth Rogoff, professor of economics and Boas chair of international economics of at uh, Harvard University. Ken, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So a lot of risks still out there. Recession coming or not coming? Well, I mean, I think, you know, very uncertain, but I'd say 25 percent chance like in a normal year. 15 percent. Mm. And this year, it's got to be higher than that, just given that a few years have passed, given how strong the growth was, how high interest rates are. And I think it's worth bearing in mind, the U.S. has been a little bit of an island here. Uh, Europe, Europe had a good year because it only had a bad year mm -hmm. and not a deep recession. Uh, China has been growing very slowly. So uh, it's, it's not that global growth is so great. It's that the U.S. did, you know, did better than expected. But you know, chances are we're growing above trend, so chances are it's going to slow down. But uh, you know, I, 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 I wasn't. I don't think I was in the camp when I spoke to you last of saying, "Oh, there's definitely going to be a recession." But I would have thought the odds at the beginning of last year were, you know, 50-50 that we would have had a recession. Do you think this is going to be a U.S. economy that needs four to six interest rate cuts? This is what the market is pricing in now, and I, I think it. It's shocking. It's surprising to see investors expect that rate of cuts. Well, it sort of depends if you think we're going to have a recession or not. If you think we're going to have a recession, yes. But if we're just having a soft landing, absolutely not. I, I think, in fact, uh, I've been saying this to you for a while, uh, the super low interest rates we saw, particularly from 2012 through 20, 2021, the real 10-year interest, interest rate average zero, the inflation index bond, Forget it. I mean, that's not coming back for a long time. I don't know, you know, ever, but not for a long time. Uh, if you look at a long history of interest rates, they have lots of these periods where they're high, they're low, and there's reversion to mean. It can take a while. And I think, you know, by and large, that's what's happening. Maybe the trend's slightly downward, but nothing like if you drew the last 40 years, it goes like that. And anyone who was extrapolating that just, just had it wrong. So the inflation will come down, but interest rates aren't going to come down proportionately. Now, that's just looking at time series statistic. It's sort of the structure. I hesitate to say exactly what it is because I've been critical of people who've been trying to explain why they're so low, uh, the secular stagnation, never productivity, demographics. But I, th I do think I can point to some things. I mean, one thing is global debt really high. And the interest rate doesn't respond hugely to it, but it's grown a lot. Uh, second, I can't imagine if we're looking at a long horizon, defense expenditures aren't going to go up worldwide a lot. Um, I want to say in the United States, if they just went up 1%, that's less than I think they're going to end up going up. And, not, and that's partly because how much they're going up in other countries. Green transition, which maybe nobody outside Davos thinks is happening, but probably will. And that's going to be really expensive. Uh, whichever, whoever wins in the US election, or any of these many elections, is probably going to be a populist, with the only question if they're a right wing or a left wing populist. Uh, more redistribution, budget deficits. So I think there are a lot of forces suggesting interest rates aren't going to come down as much. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I, again, if you look at the forecasts, they're pro probably a recession's more likely than a boom. So maybe that's partly built into what those predictions are. But I think if we have a soft landing. Maybe we'll get three cuts, uh, something like that. I think the Fed just doesn't know what it's looking for. It wants to find a path of interest rates so that inflation is stable. They don't know what it is, and they're going to feel it out. $34 trillion in total government debt. How concerned are you about that? Well, I think everybody who works on it thinks that the, it's on an unsustainable trajectory. Uh, and this interest rate issue is a big part of the equation. If you believe, and there are many uh, 
academics I respect and do, that interest rates are going to go back to what they were in the decade running through the pandemic, or even lower, well, it's a free lunch. Modern monetary theory works. Uh, you can just do whatever you want. On the other hand, if real interest rates are going to be more like 1.5% that we're paying on debt, and if growth isn't wildly higher because of AI or something, it's not sustainable. And I don't think the pol politicians in Washington are remotely ready to confront this issue. Not just in Washington, really in a lot, in a lot of the world. They're happy to talk about it, but <laughs> doing something about it is no, very that's, different. That, no, that's, that's, that's well covered. But I mean, I hear some of them in the Republican debates uh, talk about it, but it's not clear what they say they're going to do about it. Um, if we are looking at a world of higher interest rates than we have become used to for quite some time, does that mean we are looking at a world, if not a recession, but sort of permanently lower growth, or at least for the foreseeable future, oh. that we're just not going to be seeing the, the rates that we saw in the past? Well, no, I mean, I mean, not necessarily. We, we've had great growth with much higher interest rates over a long period, and many countries have. Uh, there are you know, many things that feed into that. I do think it makes the Fed's job harder. Uh, there are pressures over the next decade that are very different than we had during the globalization era. So deglobalization, who knows, but probably. Uh, geopolitical uh, risks, um, probably some of these things I mentioned, like uh, you know defense spending and such, putting pr uh, pressures on the Fed. And I, sh I should say other things like uh, maybe rising unionization, mm -hmm. monopoly power. These may be perfectly good things. Mm -hmm but they create more pressures on inflation. Um, I have a couple uh, uh, very bright uh, young co-authors. I've done some papers on this. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, our thesis is that over the next decade, you're gonna see more, oops, inflation was high than disinflation, we mm. can't control it. Well, that's, <laughs> that's not good news. Yeah, well, lastly, lastly, before we let you go, you mentioned AI. Um, we just talked to Bill Gates, and he said you know, AI may be a productivity driver for white-collar workers. He also mentioned coders. Uh, I had a conversation with the managing director of the IMF. He said AI might cause the need for more social safety nets to support displaced older workers. Where do you fall in this debate? Well, so the thing is, everything's true, mm -hmm. and the question is the pace at which it plays out. I, I've been an optimist about AI forever in the sense that I thought it was coming from my days as a chess player and watching it. But what I would always say at the same time is I don't know if our society's ready for it. And there's so many different ways. One is probably lots of jobs are going to be lost at a very fast pace. There are questions like uh, you know, how it affects uh, warfare, how it affects cyber warfare, uh, how it affects uh, you know, things like social media and what we see in the elections. So it's a, it's a wild card in a, in a lot of things. Um, I, personally, I think we really screwed up on social media by not regulating it early and letting it take time to play out. I don't see what harm there would have been if it took another five or 10 years to get to some place, even like where we are now. I think it's been phenomenal. I understand all the benefits, but on net, I think if you look at everything from our political dysfunction to mental health, it's been a negative. And AI is 10x, 100x. So although I certainly don't consider myself you know, ultra left wing, I kind of agree with progressives like uh, my neighbor in Cambridge, Elizabeth Warren, on this, that what's the harm in you know, having more regulation and slowing it down? Not a popular opinion here. But uh, that's, that's no, the way it's I see not it. from the folks we've talked to. But it is an interesting one. Ken Rogoff, thank you so much for thank spending you. some time with us. Thank you.
Houston-based Axiom Space is set to launch the first all-European commercial crew into space this week. The group, known as AX3, will board a SpaceX rocket for a two-week mission to the International Space Station. Now, this comes one week after another commercial mission, Astrobotics' attempt to become the first private company to land on the moon, suffered a critical failure hours after launch. NASA and Astrobotic are expected to provide updates on that mission at a joint teleconference on Thursday. Now, of course, most of these companies are privately held currently. So what can investors take away from this? Let's bring in Chad Anderson, Space Capital Managing Partner and author of Space Economy, to talk why you might be interested in investing space exploration this year. Thank you for joining us this morning. So for people who would like a sort of a lay of the land, because obviously space investing can be quite broad, but it includes stations, satellites, lunar logistics, launch industrials. In terms of the areas that have seen the most investment so far, which are the standouts? Yeah, thanks for having me. The couple of um, uh, stories that you've that you've highlighted this morning, you know, human space flight and missions to the moon. These are really interesting and are sort of capture the imagination. They're fun to talk about, but they really make up a small portion of the overall space economy. Um, really, the opportunity here, 90 percent of what is going on, um, whether you measure it through revenue or investment uh, or activity is really in satellites and satellites benefiting um, terrestrial markets here on Earth. So GPS, geospatial intelligence, satellite communications, um, these are the uh, three uh, sectors within the satellites industry that account for 90% of what's going on here. Um, GPS has generated trillions of dollars in economic value and some of the largest venture outcomes we've ever seen. And we're starting to see more opportunity open up in uh, geospatial intelligence and in satellite communications with SpaceX's Starlink and Amazon's um, Kuiper satellites connecting the remote places of the planet. So then as we look at some of the, the areas of investment here that have the most upside heading into 2024, then what stands out to you? I'm looking at some of that M&A activity we saw with Blue Origin. Yeah, well, 2023 was a difficult year for startups and for fundraising, for sure. And um, uh, we are seeing, you know, we're looking... Um, uh, the space economy has been ha has been very resilient, actually. So, um, and a lot of this is because everyone in this market, where enterprise dollars are tight, everyone is chasing government dollars, and um, satellite companies are providing essential information, data, and services for enterprises and governments um, who are willing to buy regardless of market cycles. So. Um, in 2023, we actually saw some record revenues for a lot of companies throughout the space economy, which is showing how um, some of these companies and some of these segments are actually counter cyclical and resilient. So we expect that to continue into 2024 and beyond as defense um, becomes um, inextricably linked between um, commercial space activities um, and the geopolitic um, reality that, that we live in today. Uh, Chad, it's Akiko here. Uh, good to talk to you again. Uh, let's talk about a story that I know you've been following closely, even though you said uh, the focus on sort of moon landing is still a small portion of the overall space economy. Um, what's happened with Astrobotic, the lander that was developed um, by the company, which you are an investor in, uh, certainly hasn't gone as planned because of the propellant link that's happened. There's a lot of investments on this hope of a robust lunar economy. And I wonder to what extent you think this could be a big setback in that? Well, it's certainly not ideal. Um, you know, they've been building um, for the last 16 years to this moment. So it's a real gut punch for the company. Um, this was the first U.S. launch to the moon in over 50 years, government or private. So the fact that they had a valve issue and a fuel leak that's going to prevent them from getting to the lunar surface is certainly um, uh, not great. But that being said, you know the, the the team has done an incredible job of of testing systems and and maximizing these mission milestones. And um, you know we've been lucky actually that they've been very transparent and have been sharing these updates as um, things have progressed. So um, look, it's the NASA's Artemis program that's underpinning a lot of the growth in in the lunar industry. They're committing billions of dollars to build a permanently crewed outpost on the moon. And um, Astrobotic was the first of the commercial lunar payload services program, which is the robotic precursor missions to the human um, Artemis missions. And so, um, 
NASA has a lot of confidence in this team and their capability. That's why they knew that they were the first um, uh, the first company up to deliver on these contracts. And they have trusted them again with um, more an, another mission later this year to carry a larger, uh, more valuable uh, rover. It's called Viper that's going to go to the South Pole and look for resources on the moon. So there has been a billion dollars invested into lunar companies over the last several years. Um, uh, Astrobotic is a leading um, company in this area. And while this was unfortunate, they have another mission later this year. And we have several other um, uh, missions, US and international later this year. So there's gonna be a lot of activity going towards the moon in 2024. Uh, Chad, you talked about satellites as a big opportunity in the space. So obviously, SpaceX is Starlink, a huge player in that. Um, in December, uh, there were reports that SpaceX was reportedly seeking a $175 billion valuation, their recent tender offer. And I wonder, I know you're an investor in SpaceX. What portion of that you think is Starlink? In other words, as there's discussions about potential spinoff of Starlink, how much of SpaceX's overall business is relying on that right now? Well, I'll tell you the way that we think about the valuation, and we still think that there's a lot of opportunity here in this name. So um, if you take the revenue opportunity for um, uh, satellite uh, communications and satellite connectivity, um, you know, we've done this analysis a few years ago, and some banks and some others have, have layered in, and it's sort of a similar story. But if you just look at Starlink and their base plan, to connect the rural areas of the world. Um, they're actually having a lot more success in pushing into urban environments. And so I think that their market opportunity has actually grown. But um, uh, there was an estimated 30 to $50 billion revenue opportunity annually for Starlink services. Um, and so if you just apply a sort of standard market multiple um, uh, to for a telecoms company or something, two and a half, three X, you get to this valuation pretty, pretty quickly. And that's not accounting for any of the other businesses and the other business lines that they have, whether it be their launch business, uh, their star shield and their government focused business, or, you know, it kind of discounts all of these emerging industries and all the human space flight and their starship program, um, which is going to go to the moon and is NASA's primary vehicle to land humans on the moon. Um, that really discounts all of the revenue from that down to zero, which they've already got billions of dollars in government contracts. Mm. Um, for that, and we're on the front end of that. So we think that um, there's still a lot of upside in SpaceX's yeah. valuation, even at the 180, 175 that it's at today. Uh, Chad, it's always good to get your insight. Appreciate you joining us today. Chad Anderson, Space Capital Managing Partner and author of Space Economy. Well, Yahoo Finance is live at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Up next, Vimal Kapoor, Honeywell CEO, is going to be talking about the aerospace industry. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. It's January, and it's cold in New York City. So the Yahoo Finance team is packing up its skis and investing knowledge and heading to the Swiss slopes for the World Economic Forum in Davos. I know what you're thinking, folks. It's colder there in Switzerland, but myself, Julie Hyman, and the Yahoo Finance live team plan to heat things up with some big-time interviews with the who's who of global business. The so-called Masters of the Universe will convene around the theme of rebuilding trust. There's no trust issues here. You can rely on us to ask the most important questions to the world's most high-profile leaders. Is the world more divided than it has ever been before? Is AI really bigger than the Internet? Is this year's huge election cycle the risk we've all been missing? Will the bull market in stocks end really badly? You won't miss anything with our wall-to-wall -wall coverage on Yahoo Finance Live and the Yahoo Finance platform, from top leaders in the banking, pharma, and crypto sectors to access the world's foremost academics and some policymakers for good measure. We've got you covered. Yahoo Finance's coverage of the World Economic Forum in Davos starts on Tuesday, January 16th. You don't want to miss it. All right, we're talking a lot here at Davos about really remaking iconic companies. And really, one of those iconic companies that we talk a lot about uh, here at Yahoo Finance is Honeywell. Uh, joining us now here at the World Economic Forum is Honeywell, uh, Honeywell's new CEO, Vimal Kapoor. Vimal, good to see you. It has been a long Thanks. time. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. So uh, before we get into what you're doing here uh, at Davos, talk to us a little bit about 
remaking Honeywell. You have come out in your mm -hmm. early days as, as CEO of the company and made some big changes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, st I got a great foundation from my predecessors and my job is to now turn Honeywell into its next chapter. And next chapter, uh, I'm really looking to make Honeywell as a more growth-oriented company. And for that, we have to set a clear North Star. Uh, and uh, the three big macros where we are pivoting Honeywell to is future of aviation, automation, and energy transition. All these three are core to us, and that really represents almost 90% of our business, so 10% doesn't really fit in roughly. And you know, it gives us a great platform to think about, this is what we want to be organically and inorganically. And all these three mega trends have a huge impact on all of us in our daily life. We all want to travel, that's what we impact. Automation impacts everything in our life. We, the products that we touch and feed, they're made by some manufacturing facility or buildings we live. And of course, energy transition, I don't have to speak for itself. We all care about it, and we all make sure that it happens in the orderly manner. And doing those things, we make impact on people's lives, and that's what excites me, making this transformation in Honeywell. So when it comes to transitioning more to a growth company, some parts of the company are already quite growthy, Correct. so to speak. Mm -hmm. Aerospace, Space. for example, right. uh, saw uh, almost 20% gain in sales uh, last, last quarter. What does the future of aviation look like? And what's the role that Honeywell is going to play in that? So two things which are, I mean, near term, we are really looking at removing the supply chain constraints. Last year, our volume grew 20%, revenue grew approximately 15%. We haven't published Q4 results, but you'll see that soon. But that's the order of magnitude there. We'll see the supply chain constraints continue to get relieved in 2024. So while we all believe supply chain has been healed, that's not true for aerospace industry yet. It still is work because a lot of it is related to touch labor, and touch labor dramatically got reduced during COVID, so you have to rebuild the scale in our supply base and retrain people and certify people. So that to me is a, is a massive uh, near-term work. What excites in aerospace is the future of aviation is going to be much more electrification. Mm -hmm. So how we're looking at offerings which enable electrification in the planes, whether it is fuel cells, whether it's how we cool the planes with the new technology, uh, you know, we call it vapor cooling system, or finally moving it to urban air mobility. Uh, will you all like to fly in a flying taxi in mm -hmm. New York? It's going to I'm be not possible. getting in one of those. I appreciate all the technology <laughs> work. I can't eventually. do it. I can't, I can't get there. But I remember Honeywell was one of the first industrial companies I wrote on as a young reporter. It was 2013 or 2014. Mm -hmm. I remember back then, we were talking about a day when planes will have no pilots. Are mm -hmm. we any closer to that? Uh, yeah. So urban air mobility is a step towards that. So the, they are being designed. Think about the autonomy in plane will be a tiered approach. Mm -hmm. The first approach will be that you have a pilot in a, in, a, in a plane, and then he or she is being supported by a remote pilot. That's step one. And then eventually, at some mm -hmm. point, the remote progression will take more and more work, and the pilot still will exist for the purpose of safety, and eventually it will become pilotless. So it's going to be the layers of uh, autonomy, and that's what we are actively working on right now. Is it feasible? Technically, yes, but then the regulations have to support, and public has to get comfortable. Uh, and I think urban air mobility is a platform to enable that as a step one. Then it goes from there to potentially to bigger platforms. So in other words, people, investors can maybe expect more cool stuff that's happening for Honeywell in the years to come. What, when you're looking at long-term growth rates that you're targeting, mm -hmm. what are you aiming for with this reorganization? So we have uh, always stated our long-term growth rate four to seven uh, percent. Last year, revenue was close to $36 billion. So think about it, we have to generate one and a half to $2 billion every year. I like it to be 7%. Uh, you know, my investor will like it to be that way. And that's what we're really programming ourselves that in this range, how do we execute our upper end of the range? How we think about new products, innovation, uh, how we think of geographic expansion and all the tools we have so that we can grow at a high rate uh, you know, in the times ahead. And you just pulled the trigger on a major acquisition, almost $5 billion yeah. of mm -hmm. carrier security mm -hmm. business. And mm -hmm. I wrote down a note, key to this is recurring revenue, right? Mm -hmm. talk, talk to us about how, the profits in that business and what is the outlook and, and why did you make that deal? So we made the deal, if you go to our buildings business, the buildings business is all about having critical products in the building. We don't sell any equipment like elevators or large equipment. There are products which building needs for safety, for environmental control. So this is an extension of our current business model that we add one more product line. So we did fire system, we did environmental controls, and now we're going to do security. And the reason we like this business is uh, it complements our core. So it's one more addition to what we know very well. 
it's high, it's more profitable, so it increases our margin rates, and it has more recurring revenue. So those are some of the strategic goals we have set for ourselves, that as we think about Honeywell, this is the new Honeywell we really want to build, and it, this target really fits very well with those purposes. So where else can we expect you to maybe make acquisitions? Because I know you have a plan to spend mm -hmm. up to $25 billion, mm -hmm. this was part of that, yeah. on acquisitions, on other kinds of capital mm -hmm. return mm -hmm. to shareholders. Mm -hmm. What should we be looking so at? So we committed $25 billion in three years, and that's spent into four buckets, the dividend capital spend, those are about $4 billion a year, times three, so give and take about 11 to $12 billion, and the balance half of money is available either for M&A or share repurchases. We like to be biased more towards M&A, and that will be focused upon creating future of aviation, making our capability better in automation, our energy transition. So our North Star is set. You expect us to do acquisition around this framework, so you won't find us to go to some unrelated area. That's my goal, to strengthen Honeywell in these three vectors, organically and inorganically. And there are a lot of exciting opportunities, because these are very big markets, there are new technologies which are coming in, or we may have no strong position in some places where we have opportunity to go and acquire. Not a lot of folks get to lead iconic companies mm -hmm. in, in the CEO role. Tell investors a little bit about yourself. How did you get this job? I imagine it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, I, I have to. You have to summarize about a thirty-year well, career. Well, about yeah, minute, you're a Honeywell lifer, right? Yeah, I'm a Honeywell here. lifer. Yeah, I was joined Honeywell in '89. I joined in the joint venture in India. I would say, then, look, there is no uh, easy step. First of all, when I joined in '89, I didn't join to become CEO of Honeywell. I joined a good company, and I felt I'm going to work here for a long time. And I never said no to any role. Uh, whatever role came in. Good I tip, good tip. Okay, go ahead, 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 go ahead. keep going, keep going. That you, you trust the organization that every role is important and they give you a role and you add value into the role and you move on to the next role. So having, what I did was I got a lot of diverse experiences in different businesses in different countries. I worked in India for sure for a long time and in UK for many years and I'm in US now for the last 10 plus years. So I think it's a diversity of experience and willingness to take some personal risk uh, if you don't take risk to yourself to say, if you want to find a perfect job, it doesn't exist. <laughs> and there will be always an element of risk to say, okay, it looks like I know 70 to 80 percent, 20 to 30 percent, I don't know. And I took those risks and uh, I, mean, I, I executed well. And Honeywell has been fair to me. I think that's one of the strength of Honeywell. We don't have to talk about inclusion, diversity, or meritocracy. I mean, we practice it and uh, I benefited from that. Well said, well cool to see you with this role. You were one of the first folks that we talked to when we launched our live programming here at Yahoo Finance. We thank you for the time then, we thank you for the time now. Uh, Vimal Kapoor, Honeywell CEO, enjoy uh, Davos. Thank you very Appreciate much, it. thanks for thank having you. me. Well, as we head into the noon hour, let's get your final check of the markets. Still seeing red across the board here. Only the Nasdaq briefly dipped into the green earlier this morning before retreating. The Dow currently off about 196 points. The S&P 500 also down about a third of a percent, down 14 points. Tech heavy Nasdaq there down about 28 points on the day. Investors digesting more big, big bank earnings. Also a lot of Fed speak, including from Federal Reserve Governor uh, Christopher Wallace saying that interest rate cuts, while likely this year, really did caution that the Fed should move carefully. So investors really trying to, to make the most of that and, and sort of pass through some of the wording there. Well, that does it for now, but I'm Rochelle Cooper alongside Akiko Fujita. Stay with us on Yahoo Finance.